Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Knights of Last Call. Uh, tonight, I am joined by a special guest, a hero from the Knights of Last Call Patreon. Uh, it is Elia. Elia, how are you? I am doing well. Wonderful. How are you? I'm, I'm excited to have you here. I'm excited to be talking about Forbidden Lands, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is a game that uh, you and I both uh, really enjoy. <laughs> And uh, you and for for context for people who aren't necessarily from the uh, Patreon, um, she and I don't always agree on um, on everything uh, about how to run a game master, uh, how to run a game. Some of the elements of games that I really like, uh, she does not necessarily like, uh, and that's what's great about it. There's a lot that we do agree on. I should I shouldn't you know make it seem like you're hate everything about what I do, but. Um, uh, I hate everything you stand for, Derek. You, which, you are right. you are the worst. Right, you which is why which is why she is the <laughs> model, the paragon of being a Knights of Last Call patron. Um, but no, but what's interesting, of course, is the conversations that we have, a lot of conversations um, that you might even see here on the stream started as a conversation between myself and patrons um, like Alia, and that's what makes uh, having folks – on the uh, on the stream so much fun because not a, you know sometimes people don't always agree with us but forbidden lands is kind of a unique game uh because it's an uh, intersection that uh it's a system and an, and a concept in a world that i really like but it's also one that she really likes so before i get uh too far into it just real quick uh for those of you who don't know uh forbidden lands is a uh, by of course free league which a lot of people know has been producing a ton of games over the last couple of years. They um, really have. Yeah, they really have. Uh, with a lot of uh, IPs that they have acquired, like Aliens and, uh, geez, I think they did uh, Fallout. Or is that 2D20? No, that's 2D20. But like Free League, uh, Tales from the Loop. Like So a lot of these like pretty you know up-and-coming properties or relatively new properties have been acquired by Free League. They, they now do the One Ring um, they do the Lord of the Rings game. So Free League has Blade Runner. Thank you, Sean. Um, and most of their games use a variant or a, a sort of a system uh, called the Year Zero Engine uh, or YZE. And Forbidden Lands is sort of one of the earlier versions of this. Uh, I think Mutant Year Zero and Twilight 2K were some of the earlier ones. But um, so the Year Zero Engine might be you might not necessarily like forbidden lands but you might like this system of dice and dice pools so something to keep in kind of mind as you go through here is that even if you're not really digging this game you might really like the year zero engine and might want to play it in blade runner or you know some other you know uh type of world the other thing to consider is that you might not like the year zero engine but there's a lot of meat in this game for sort of that old school simulationist hex crawl wilderness survival that you could probably lift and steal and probably bring into your favorite fantasy rpg system so there's a lot of meat on the bone for us vultures to pick or you might like both um so with that in mind uh before we kind of get into it i'm curious how did you uh kind of get introduced to this game and uh, like what was, what, what, what prompted you to pick it up and what prompted you to get, you know, kind of interested in it? Uh, well, honestly, uh, the predictable answer is the correct one here. It's, I heard about it from this community. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't remember who exactly it was that it might've been, it might've been GM Scott. I don't remember that I first heard about it from, um, but that did prompt me to look into it. I'm like, oh, this looks really cool. Um, you know, it's got really good foundry support. It looks really well fleshed out. And um, this looks like the kind of game I would enjoy. So I went ahead and uh, purchased it and uh, started reading through the rules. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, um, and I was actually surprised by how much of this game that I thought was cool because I kind of expected to go into it expecting like, all right, there's going to be all this narrative stuff. I'm not going to be super into that. And, you know, um, but yep. it actually turned out to be like, honestly, 
pretty cool. Yeah, so pretty cool. And, and just and, because of the way it interacts with uh, all the other mechanics. Right. It feels like a very well integrated game. And I think that's what makes it such a, a joy to read through. And, mm -hmm. you know, for those of you who may not be uh, as uh, regulars here, uh, you know, we I talk a lot about GNS and I understand that the theory has its flaws, but I do think there is some value in understanding what kind of elements a certain TTRPG brings to the table. And Forbidden Lands, while it does have gamest elements, don't get me wrong, we'll talk about those. The game oh, it sure does. <laughs> the game the game really feels in some ways like Legend of the Five Rings in that way, where it has strong element board game elements where it feels like I'm playing a game. Like there are things for me to Jenga. There are things for me to fiddle with. Um, like you would expect to see in a game, you know, like feats and, you know, little dice roll modifiers, like very gamey stuff. But it also has some highly, highly involved simulationist aspects, which are sort of missing from a lot of those type of games while still managing to interject a small amount of narrativism. And that's what makes this game kind of occupy a very strange spot. And especially you who typically aren't really much of a, a narrativist, I would say, uh, in terms of mechanics that force you to role play a certain way or, you know, reward you if you role play a certain way. It, it's a very, for me, that's a very, it's a very delicate thing. Yeah. Um, I, so it, it's, I have very complicated feelings on that, as I'm <laughs> sure you're well aware. I'm um, well aware. I'm well aware. Um, essentially, I want narrative mechanics to matter sure. if you're going to have them in your game they should matter you know blades in the dark they matter pbta games they matter um pathfinder 2 they don't matter <laughs> <laughs> right exactly exactly um so uh, and that that's the crux of it is i i as much as i'm not a fan of them in general if they're going to be there then they should they should matter um yeah, yeah. And that's that's really my big thing and I do feel like that they matter in Forbidden Lands without being without being too intrusive would be the best way I could put it. I agree. I completely agree. Jonka just tipped $15 says, "Been interested in this system for a minute now. Thank you for covering it. Keep it up with these system deep dives and first looks. Y'all go more in depth than most channels do." Well, most channels don't uh talk about games as often as we do and really focus on a bunch of other systems and of course, you know, go for two or three hours as we usually do. Um, by the way, as we yeah. sort of uh, thank Jonka for his tip, I do want to really quickly, um, as I've sort of had a, a this month is sort of a celebration, uh, if you will, of some of our newer, um, I should say some of our old, but now upgraded uh, folks who have upgraded to our premium legend and exalted tiers. These are folks who are really donating a lot of money to the Knights of Last Call. And I like to just give them a quick shout out to sort of really show some love <clears> and respect. <throat> um, so thank you to Karamak, Donnie Taylor, GM Scott, Laughing Out Law, Rick S, Ryan Dale, Whipplestein, Ben A, Hawkeye, Boothby, Darth Gorlock, John Bonanza, The Unfortunate Pumpkin, Low Class, Omrid, Mundar, Sean, a.k.a. The Skull Bunny, Simo Sama, Hoyrit, and Zuil. So thank you uh, to those uh, uh, fine individuals for uh, upgrading this month. Um, it's been really awesome to see everybody start to interact with our ticket system and buying merch. I got to ship out like uh, 13 t-shirts this week. Um, and that's kind of like a, it's a fun thing for me as a, a channel creator to be able to, have a, able to have that opportunity to do something cool and unique and different. So thank you so much to everybody who supports us, um, but a special shout out for them. So let's, let's look, let's, let's take a look here at what we have for Forbidden Lands. For starters, I think you'll agree. I mean, the quality on these books and the art is so good. Really like the art. It's, it's very evocative. It's like, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, look at it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so good. <laughs> Just it's, look at it. It's yeah. um, it's you know, it's you don't see you don't see art like that in a lot of places. Right. Anymore. This this is not your superhero Wayne's Reynolds type art, and I yeah, think that's important yeah. because it's it's really setting the tone for this game. And actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually sure. read a couple paragraphs from the opening sections just to sure, really like, make sure that people can understand kind of what this game is going about. Yeah. So, real quick before we go into it. Um, this is the, this is the hard copy of the book, by the way, this is the, this is the player's guide. Um, it's this beautiful sort of faux leather cover, uh, kind of Does look really good. digest size, got a nice little ribbon. Um, and the, the GM, the GM, the GM guide is, is much the same. Um, so they're both just beautiful books and all the books that 
Free League puts out are really, really great. So if we take a look at the table of contents here, we see we've got, you know, six or seven pages about the introduction, what's what's the role-playing game, uh, but it also talks a little bit about what this game is different. And, you know, <laughs> what do you do is like the, the second thing that they talk about, which to me, and again, <laughs> if you're on this channel, you know that I'm always like, what does this game want me to do? I like a game that's not afraid to be about something. And this game is definitely not afraid to be about something. Um, then we have, gonna, oh, what's that? Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at uh, Sean's comment in the chat there. Uh, sure. Bring up death spirals. We'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely we'll get, get to, to that. that. <laughs> um, without going ahead, uh, I would say this game does have some death spirals. W would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> Two words, uh, ability, ability uh, damage, ability, ability damage, score, well, ability score damage, three words in that case. But, yeah, right, right. Exactly. AKA but you get the idea. also you don't have hit points. So when you take yeah. damage, you take ability score damage. Um, yeah. yeah so there's turns is out if you get stabbed, it's hard to fight. Exactly. So it turns who would have thunk it? Really crazy. And again, I think it's just leaning into, uh, that sort of, uh, concept, but next we get into how to make a character. We talk about kin, which is their word for species or race or ancestry. And most of these are gonna be your standard fantasy tropes. And then you have your character's profession, which shouldn't come to as anybody's surprise, is like your class. Then we'll talk about your character's age, attributes, and skills, which yes, do matter in this game. <clears throat> oh, um, yeah. Your pride and dark secret, which tie into the sort of narrativist element that the game has. And then lastly, we'll talk about your gear, encumbrance, and consumables. Uh, as we said before, this game has sort of an old school feel to it uh, where wilderness exploration and survival is sort of a, of a key component. And so how much food and water and other resources you have is something that your character is going to be routinely faced with. Um, and then we'll get into the skills. We probably won't go through every single uh, uh, skill or talent, but we'll talk about how the dice roll mechanic works, how the year zero engine dice roll mechanics. We'll talk about pushing, which I think is great. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about talents, which let's just call it what it is. They're like feats. They're feats. They're feats. They're, feats. they're, they're, feats. they're straight up feats. Yep. They're feats. Um, combat and damage. This is where the game, I think it's very gamey. Yeah. This, this is where the, the gamest elements that I tend to enjoy, um, kind of come to the forefront is the combat system. It gets very crunchy. Yep. And then we have some magic. And then the last two chapters of the book, um, are journeys and the stronghold. And and I'll talk more about this, but you know, this is this is one of those what I call n n new OSR movements um where <laughs> hey, Jason B just tipped. <laughs> uh I have by the way, I'm sorry, I have the speech off for uh, whenever I have guests, I have speeches off. Oh, a new game system. How does this one help small <clears throat> indie companies sell more APs? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> um, because Free League has actually been putting out a fair number of, I don't know what you would call them, adventure campaigns. Not, I don't know what to call um, them. World settings that are full of ideas. I don't know how to. So, because they're not APs. I, hmm. They're not actually. No, they're they're not. They're. I would say I would I would call them um, almost kind of sub settings. Maybe might be sure. a good word for it. Because they're all set in the same world, but each one sure. sort of dives into a specific region region and they're all kind right. of like sort of separated from each other but you could you can technically travel between them right right exactly um, um and there there is like a world map that yeah. shows you the the whole breadth of the world right yeah and it's... one thing you'll notice is that you know only like three of the regions from the world map are actually covered with the uh expansion content they, that they have at the moment right it's a big world but yeah it's it's like a campaign module says sean linked adventure sites <clears throat> is what ryan says we'll, we'll talk about it for sure but needless to say um they do have adventures and they've i think they've come out two or three so far um beyond the original one which lift launched with the game which was called raven's purge um but we will focus on these journeys and stronghold at the end because this is again getting back to that sort of new old school mechanics where you know we've talked about this on the history of classes building a fortress becoming a lord or a lady um establishing a domain a wizard's tower a thieves guild that was sort of the de facto transition in original D, &D first edition D, D, and that kind of went away from the game this game brings it back and in, in, in a fairly big way which is kind of really cool and exciting to see um, so 
Um, I want to just talk about this. I'm just going to read this really quick uh, from the introduction. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. And, uh, you know, specifically here it says, Welcome to Forbidden Lands. In this tabletop role-playing game, you are not heroes sent on missions <laughs> dictated by others. Full stop already. That is just so different from what we're used to. I mean, most adventure paths, most pre-written adventures are usually some sort of fetch quest, right? Where somebody yeah. else is telling you what to go do. You're you're the big damn heroes. I'm the quest giver. Uh, right. Here's what's happening. Go do the thing. Exactly. Um, go find the letter in the room that leads you to the next room that right. leads you to the next BBEG. You exactly. Know? And then buy and then beat, beat that BBEG so you can buy the next adventure module <laughs> in our yes, series. Yes, exactly. Yeah, um, buy the it, new book. Exactly. So instead, <laughs> you are raiders and rogues bent on making your own mark on a cursed world. You will wander the wild lands, discover lost tome, tombs, fight monsters, and if you live long enough, build your own stronghold to defend. During your adventures, you will uncover the dark secrets of dark powers lurking in the shadows. And in the end, you could be the ones that decide the fate of the Forbidden Lands. And then it talks a little bit, of course, about the, the players and the game master. But again, if you're familiar with this channel and, and, and you know the kind of games that I like, I'm going to say some words here that are going to just, you know, bing, ding, ding, light bulbs in your brain. Um, the game master. The final player is the game master or GM. The GM describes the Forbidden Lands to you. They play the people you meet during your journeys. They control the monsters roaming the forest. They decide where the treasure is buried. The game is a conversation between the players and the GM back and forth until a critical situation arises where the outcome is uncertain. Then it's time to break out the dice. I mean, that is that is the most straight lifted from Apocalypse World type of sentence of all time. And this is what I was talking about where I said, these are old school concepts, hex crawling, resources, strongholds, but they're taking these ideas that have come out in the last 15, 20 years and putting them into their game, which I really, really love. Um, yeah. And I, I fundamentally agree with the idea that you should, the, the dice should come into play when the outcome is uncertain. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's just a fundamental uh, necessity for these kinds of games. And in fact, as we'll see later on, if you don't do that, you open up your game to abuse. Sure. Uh, because yeah. of uh, willpower spam. Um, oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about that. It's like it's probably like the one part of the system I'm a little soft on. But anyways. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, it's it's the GM's job to put obstacles in, into the, your path and challenge your PCs, forcing them to show what they're really made of. But it is not up to the GM to decide everything that happens in the game. And above all, not how your story is supposed to end. That is decided in the game. That's why you're playing the game to find out how your story ends. So again, just this kind of language and putting this forward out here saying like, before we get into what our game's about, uh, we wanna let you know that like, don't play this like your railroad type game. It's not designed to do that. It really sure, is about yeah. empowering the players. So what yeah. do you do? Well, you, you're gonna explore the world, <clears throat> exploring a world which has been in this particular campaign shift uh, uh, hidden by blood mist for hundreds of years. You're gonna discover adventure sites, uncover secrets of the land and search for the four elven gemstones. And this is a really interesting thing. This is a player's book and they're telling you about the campaign. And it says, look, the way that this campaign is structured, there are these four elven gemstones. There are gonna be people who are looking out for searching for them and trying to find them. And you could go get them or you could not. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Raven's Purge is not a linear story. It has no set goal that your adventurers are expected to follow. Instead, it is a rich tapestry of legends, locations, and characters and events that your characters will be able to interact with. So it's almost like there's a lot of stuff going on in the background and you can yeah. get involved or you cannot get involved. You might see some of it. You might see other part, you know, you might miss other parts of it and that's totally fine. Sure. Stuff is going to happen whether or not you interact with it. And I think that's part of what, what makes this a, um, a sandbox, right? Exactly. Um, right. You, you can't stop everything. You can't be everywhere. You're not always sure. going to. And, and yeah. ultimately, your decisions, your successes, and your failures are all going to matter because there is no outcome that is inevitable. And that's what makes it so fun. I have a very quick question yeah. for you, though, Derek. Yeah. Um, so I've seen a lot of people um, levy a uh, accusation, if you will, at you that, you know, you don't care about lore, right? You don't care about story. You only care about mechanics. I've seen that levied at you. Yes. Would you agree with that? I've seen that levied against me. So, yes. So I'm going to give you a chance right now to prove them all wrong. Okay. okay? I got I got a quick pop quiz for you. Okay. 
why is it called the Forbidden Lands? Well, it's called the Forbidden Lands because many years ago it was called the Ravenlands, and it was the promised land that was gifted to humans. And Zygofor the Spellbender led his people to the north. However, he summoned a uh, summoned uh, an army of demons in order to com combat his enemies, and the good king sealed off the lands and forbid people to travel north because of the great demonic powers unleashed there by Zygofor the Spellbender and his daughter Tyrania, and thus it became known as the Forbidden Lands. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, 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 the, the, uh, a powerful mist arose called the blood mist, which would kill anyone who left their area. And so it was forbidden to enter there. In fact, they built a wall actually blocking off that section of the campaign. How'd I do? Uh, I am actually quite impressed <laughs> that you uh, absorbed all that. Um, hey. But yeah, I, I think I think that is a correct answer. Yeah. I have it written down on my palm for sure. Beyond beyond the correct answer, I would say. I, I like, here's why I like lore like that. Because that lore speaks to adventure. That lore is all about setting up cool adventure sites. It's about, I like sure. to keep that stuff in my brain. Because that's how I can come up with the next cool adventure. Or the next cool uh, yeah. moment in the game. I What I don't care is like, that, you know, Anchor Root's favorite tea is chamomile. I I, I don't. What what am I supposed to do with that? Why why is that why is that in my book? That's not sure. Lore. Like that's uh, <laughs> that, that's where like I don't that's where I don't care. But uh, um, I, I appreciate you calling me out on that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it wasn't meant as a call out. It was it was kind of meant as a you know you know prove these people wrong yeah. kind of opportunity. Uh, but what I want to segue into there is, um, I I feel like the setting, uh really kind of feeds into what the system is designed to do which is sure. focus on exploration because for the last you know 300 years like three generations mm -hmm. three or four generations um or at least human generations um like the history of the world's been kind of forgotten about right right like, no one really even knows what's out there anymore because they can't go more than you know half a day's travel or so out of their their towns before they have to turn back. Uh, but now that the uh, blood mist has suddenly lifted, suddenly like everyone can just go wherever they want, uh, which is kind of essentially about the point where, you know, the game picks up. Right. Is and you are actually exploring a land that has since been forbidden, hence the title. Right. And you you don't know what's out there. You know, it's not. Um, yeah, well, you know, I mean. No it's not Galarian. Like right. you don't like, no. like it hasn't been mapped. <laughs> right. You know. I mean, no surprises here. What this is what this is really replicating is what fourth edition would call a points of light campaign. Right? Where you have points of civilization in an otherwise dark sea. And most for most people, they will never go beyond their small point of light because beyond that, you know, there lie here lie dragons. And, exactly. and they, they basically have created an environment where that is kind of universally true. And they did it through this really cool means and gave you a reason for why you're like the first generation of adventurers to be going out into this unexplored land. Because as you mentioned, it was previously unexplorable, um, which makes it really great. And, they, you know, in Bitter Reach, which is the second campaign, which is in the frozen north, the idea there is it's just like, well, it's really freaking cold. Uh, like no one can live up there. It's just unsurvivable. Um, I have not done any trial runs uh, up in the Bitter Reach part of the map, but my understanding is that it is quite a bit more deadly uh, than Ravenland. Right. Yes. And For they, obvious reasons. Yeah, they include whole new mechanics designed to kill sure. you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Ryan exactly. says, my favorite part, adventure map and stickers. Yeah. Um, if, you've, if you've ever played Gloomhaven, there's a little bit of a legacy-like game element to this, at least with the box set, um, where... It comes with a really, really cool map. I don't know if I have um, the map available on a PDF. Let me take a look. I might have it. Um, but what's what's cool about it is that it's uh, a hex map that is designed for you to sort of explore uh, as a... Oh, I do have it. Um, that's designed for you to explore. And as you go into these different hexes, um, some of them have the opportunity for there to be a dungeon or a mm -hmm. keep or a castle or a fortress. And what you can do is the book provides you with some 
uh, pre-made ones that you can use as part of the campaign, or just some blank ones that you can either make up <clears> your <throat> own, or the, the the campaign book has like a whole encyclopedia of different cool adventure sites, which are not like fully mapped out dungeons. It's more like a concept and an idea because the game is right. isn't super rules heavy. You know, it's a little rules light. Anyways, and you get these cool stickers, and then as you're exploring the Ravenland, you get to you know put these stickers down, and you can the players can you know, legitimately might not know what lies out there until they discover it, which is really cool. And I do want to mention, uh, especially because we were talking about this a little bit before the stream, but um, in the game master section of the, uh, of the game, uh, the, the book, it will tell you, it will give you tools and tables that will help you uh, as a game master randomly generate essentially uh, dungeons for your players to explore and find stuff in. Yeah, and if we have time, um, we'll definitely open that book up yeah, as well. Uh, without getting too much into it right now, but I just figured that was worth a shout out at this point. Yep. So, um, you know, you need dice to play. You know, what's a typical game session like? Um, in fact, this is kind of useful to understand. Again, what are you getting into this? Um, well, you get your map, your character, your sheets, your dice, and the custom cards if you're using them. You don't need them, but... Obligatory, what is a game section here? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, summarize the last session. Play your characters, live their lives as if you were, and act as if they were actual people, but play daringly and push the limits of your character. This is something I always talk about, right? Where I say, you know, drive it like you stole it. You know, play your character like it's a stolen car. Who cares if you crash it, right? You can always get another one. So like it's saying, play your character and live them, but don't, but be bold, be daring. That's why you're playing a role-playing game, or at least in mm -hmm. theory you should be. Why, if you want to live, why did you choose to play in this game where death sure. is just waiting around the corner? No. Um, that being said, I do want to say real quick, that being said, this is a combat is war game, hands down. Mm. This is not this is not a game with, uh, you know, you know, encounter XP budgets where everything yes. is designed to be balanced. This is a game where your GM's going to make a travel roll and they're going to, you know, look at this event that they rolled and say, OK, well, you encounter 1D whatever, you know, creatures. And maybe that turns into a combat encounter. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's balanced. Maybe it's not. Right. Maybe it's one sided. Maybe you kick their shit in. Like right, it could go any way. There's no, and you have it is on it is on the players to decide and intuit if this is a fight worth fighting or if it's even worth picking a fight at all. And and to be clear, there's still logic and sense to that. Like for example, the deep dark forest or the scary foreboding peaks and mountains are going to be probably a lot more deadly than, you know, the idyllic river valley. Like that's just sure. that's just the way things go. Um sure. and so there's a sense of like, well, that makes sense and yep, and that is the case, right? Yeah. It's like sure you're rolling on a table, but your results for your encounter events are dependent on the type of region and terrain you are in. Right. So, uh you know, it's all kind of um designed to make sense. And what I think is really cool about some of these encounters uh is that a lot of them lead into uh, what are called legends, and we'll get into that probably in a little bit. But uh, essentially, like these encounters can kind of give you clues as to like the history of the world, because remember that uh, you know for the past several generations, no one's really been right. out and about and exploring. So uh, some of these random encounters can give you clues about what's been going on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, this is something that I I used back in the day. In like third edition uh, dungeon, uh, in third edition in Pathfinder one, in like big dungeon delves, like how do I make this more than just traps and treasure? And it's because there's like it's like there's these layers of lore. It's like an onion, and the players get this. And I I used to ward experience points for that. And I think I think one of the questions yeah. at the end is, did we learn something secretive and new about the Forbidden Lands? I might not. Yeah, I might be wrong there, but uh, uh, I think you're correct because yeah. there is a there's a checklist you go down at right. the end of every because experience session. points. It's not decided by you know. Oh, mm -hmm. I fought a I fought a 120 XP severe. No, it, yeah. you ask a series of questions, basically like, did you do cool forbidden land shit? Did you yeah. establish a stronghold? Did you explore strange new worlds? Did you seek out new life and <laughs> new civilization? Um, exactly. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so uh, it, it it the experiences actually comes down to hey, you know, I always say what are the three <clears> rules, <throat> right? Or the, the three questions, which is what is this game about? 
what are the tools, uh, what are the mechanics that the game does in order for you to do that thing? And then if you do the thing that the game says it's about, how does the game reward you? And in this case, mm -hmm. it's pretty close to uh, the reward section is pretty much a one for one. It, you know, they say, hey, the game is about these things. We're going to give you mechanics that support those things. And then we're going to ask you questions at the end of the session. Did you do that thing? Get experience. <laughs> Did you do that thing? Get experience. And that makes yeah. it, I mean, it's a pretty simple analog. Um, and then, of course, what is a role playing game? So. Of course. Very, very, very cool here. Um, I mean, they really want to drive this home. Uh, Elia, it's like, you are no hero. <laughs> you yeah, don't, well. You don't you know, fight it's... to protect the realm or put the true king on the throne. You hunt through ancient sure. ruins for treasure. You help those who help you. You make your own mark on the Forbidden Lands. Your fate isn't determined by someone else. You choose your own path. You are an adventurer. <laughs> <laughs> right. And my understanding is this is kind of part of the OSR callback of the system is, yeah. you know, when you were, you know, Back in the the you know olden editions, so to speak, you know you weren't necessarily big damn heroes. You were, uh, you know, you were rogues. You yeah. were ne'er do wells. You know, delving into dungeons, uh, looking to make your fortune. And there's a little bit of that going on here. I feel like. Yep. So choosing your uh, creating a character is a twelve step process, and we'll definitely spend we'll spend probably about the next half hour <clears throat> talking about how you make a character. Uh, first, you choose your kin, a.k.a. your ancestry. Then you pick your profession, your class. You pick your age. Your age actually determines how many feats and how many skills you get uh, and your attributes, your stats, if you will. So you're going to spend your points on your attributes. There's only four in this game. Mm -hmm. Then you'll get your skills, and then you'll get your talents, which are basically your feats. You'll choose a pride, a dark secret, define your relationships to the other characters, Pick your gear, decide your appearance, and choose your name. So it's a pretty straightforward uh, process. Yep. I, I I would say making a character probably takes twenty to thirty minutes tops. Maybe that sounds about right to me. That's uh, that's about what it took when I did a little bit of a trial run. Let me uh, see the if game. they have at the end of this. Do they have the character sheet? Let me see. Yeah, I mean, your th this is your character sheet. Um, yeah. it's pretty basic. You've got uh. Strength, agility, wits, empathy, and you've got mostly just filling out your, you know, what's, what feats do you have? What are your appearance? And then you have your skills. So it's, you know, it's pretty much like a really, really simple third edition <clears throat> type character sheet. It's pretty, pretty basic. Yeah, um, I, I agree with the, what Ryan Dale there is saying is I, I really like the kind of uh, style of the character sheet itself. Yeah, it, it feels very like it's not slick or, you know, it feels very like hand drawn. And that's really, yeah. really cool. Um, so. For the most part, um, your ancestry doesn't matter a ton. Um, it mm, debatable. Okay, okay. So debatable. Um, you know, it, it'll tell you. Like to be clear, from a rules perspective, it gives you your kin talent, which is basically right. like your ancestry ability. Sure. What, and, what... and that's the reason why I say debatable because <laughs> those are actually very impactful depending on what you want to do. All right, fair enough, but. Uh, you know, especially compared to other old school games, you can see here there's, sure. there's typical professions, but there's nothing restricted or limited in that regard. Um, and, uh, you know, what are the, what are the attribute that you're, you're, you know, tend to focus on and be, you know, linked to. But for the most part, the only thing mechanically that your ancestry does is your kin talent. Sure. Yeah. Like there's no stat adjustments and that yeah. I'm aware of or anything like that. So we've got your, that is true. you've got your human, you've got your elves. You've got your half elves. Um, as a just a note, humans gain the adaptive ability. Elves gain the uh, what is it called? The inner peace ability. Yep. Half elves gain psychic power. <laughs> okay. Uh, dwarves gain true grit. Halflings gain hard catch. And then we start getting into sort of the unique ancestries uh, or kin of Forbidden Lands. There is the wolf kin. Your your wolf dog people. Um, with which have hunting instincts, orcs, yep. which are have unbreakable, and goblin, which have <clears> nocturnal. <throat> but unlike Pathfinder 2nd Edition, they basically are kind of like, yeah, orcs and goblins are still kind of bad guys. Um, they even have a little sidebar here where it says, orcs are feared and hated by most other kin. Playing an orc will therefore present unique challenges to you and your group. If you want to play an orc, it's a good idea to discuss this with your group first. Mm -hmm. um, so this isn't like they're not, they're not, Disney-fying all of these races. They're saying, look, if right. you want to be an orc, we we have the rules for it, but it, we're not going to make it easy for you. You you could easily get run out of town. You could get 
you know, killed sure. by an angry mob because people do not like your kin. Yeah. Um, and um, jumping off of that, maybe uh, if you want to run a campaign where all the PCs are orcs, like that's totally cool. And that could be a lot of fun. But part of the fun of that is the challenges that that party is going to face. Absolutely. And it's not like it's balanced. It's not like, oh, so they get a really good stat line or something because, you know, they're going to be facing sure. prejudice. No, no, it's just that. It, yeah, yeah, it's no, just, no. It's, it's, it's just, just the way just, the setting is. Um, just the way it is. Um, uh, I will mention that there is, uh, other than the kin talent, there is one other important aspect to choosing uh, your kin, okay. which is their, their key attribute. Okay. Yes, um, yes. And that is important, um, as we can, we'll we'll see when we get to we the, can see when we get character to the creation rules. Yeah, exactly. Got it. So then we have our profession, um, and uh, these are basically your D20 uh, type fantasy classes. Um, the type of profession or class that you have, it determines another one of your key attributes. So between your kin and your profession, you're going to have two key attributes. Um, it'll also tell you what your starting list of skills are. And then it'll tell you your pride, dark secret, or relationships. But here's the thing. It says choose an option or pick your own or create your yep. own. These are just suggestions. Yep. There really aren't, you know, like for the pride, it's like you are nobler than other people and the gods love you more. You sense <laughs> unnatural phenomena before anyone else. Demons instinctively fear you. Cool. Yep. But you don't have to pick one of those. They just gave you this in <laughs> case you're like, I can't think of anything. Um, exactly. So in, 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 in a, essentially, this could say pride, pick a pride. Dark secret, yeah. pick a dark secret. Um, uh, relationships, create a relationship. Um, and then you have a very basic gear thing. And we'll talk about resource dice here in a second. But um, Would you say it's similar to how, um, like in Legend of the Five Rings, when it gives you like a list of opportunities to pick from is it is it kind of a similar yeah idea? i mean i mean like, i would say that legend of the five pick rings one of these but you, you don't have to right legend of the five rings is even i mean they're saying hey here's a list and if you want to make your own you can but their list is very pretty extensive you know here there's sure. 30 or 40 things to pick from much um, more extensive than this and, yes and by the way that's it that's that's the class like that was the druid yeah. um so really the only thing mechanically that really comes out of this is the key attribute the the skills and then your starting gear, which you know arguably doesn't really matter that much once the game starts getting going. So uh, now while this will affect what talents or feats that you can take, uh, which makes a big deal, in terms of like yep. the class chassis, that's it. So we've got the druid, we've got the fighter, should come as no surprise here, the key attribute is strength. You know, you can see that their skills are things like might and endurance and melee um, and so on and so forth. So we've got the hunter, AKA, you know, your ranger type, the minstrel, AKA your bard type, uh, the peddler. So now we're starting to get into like a little bit of things that you might not typically see in a fantasy game. Sure. Um, uh, there's a lot to talk about with the empathy attribute and what you can do with it. Right. Um, that, that kind of ties into the narrative and social mechanics of the game. Uh, and the peddler is kind of a class that is about that. Yes, um, absolutely. If you want to play like, you know, the face, the fast talker, or the silver tongue, like peddler is pretty good for that. Whoopelstein with a $10 super chest says, working on trying to make a hex crawl based site for Northern Reaches, hoping to pick up some good ideas from this and any other related streams. Yeah. I mean, especially the, this and the GM screen uh, or the GM guide are, are going to be a nice resource um, for coming up with some cool ideas for sure. Um, yeah, I, I think the peddler also speaks to this idea that the game isn't just about fighting monsters. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Right. It, it's about sometimes the monsters are the people, <laughs> yeah. right. You know, like, and <laughs> yeah. And actually there is a, there's a distinction between a, a monster and an NPC in this right. game. Right. In fact, when you go, the, the game talks about three different types of adventure sites. One is called a fortress or like a tower. One is called a dungeon and the other one's called like a town or village. Like that mm -hmm. can be an adventure site because it's like, sure. you might be the first people coming into that town. It's very like dogs in the vineyard esque, right? Where it's like, you're a group of outsiders coming into a town that's kind of been pretty isolated and xenophobic. They might have their own yeah. dark secrets and problems that they've been dealing with. Um, so pretty cool. Um, we've got the rider. <clears throat> Uh, which is definitely, a, you know, sort of your mounted cavalier option. The yep. rogue, of course. The sorcerer, of course. Of course. 
Um, and I think that's it. Yep, that's it. So then you pick your age and this will influence your attributes, your skills, and your talents. And by and large, the younger you are, the better your attributes are. But if you're older, you get more skills. So right. that's kind of like the trade-off that you're making. Uh, of course, it depends on your kin, which you know age range you want to be. You could choose your age freely. And this is a good time to point out what I was alluding to earlier is you want to think very careful about your choices here because while you can increase, you can spend the XP you get to increase your skills, you cannot increase your attributes normally. There might be, uh, you know, artifacts or something you might find that'll increase your attributes. But for the most part, you cannot spend XP to increase your attributes. So it's a big incentive to choose to be a young character, but you know, there's a trade-off for that, which is, yeah, You'll you have start, higher you, attributes, you, but you start, you start off, with less skills. You start off sucking, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't have any, you don't have any yeah. skills or cool powers. You're, you're playing the long game is what you're kind of going for <laughs> right. there, essentially. Um, right. Absolutely. So that um, is an important thing to keep in mind. And here we can see uh, the four stats that exist in this game or four attributes. They are strength, which represents not basically it's con and strength. It's kind of one, they kind of combine strength and con mm -hmm. into one role. Agility, which is basically dexterity. So those are your two physical attributes. And then you have wits, which is sort of a combination of intelligence and wisdom. And then empathy, which is pretty much charisma. And so uh, you kind of have the six stats, but they're kind of compressed into four. And quite frankly, I really like that because I, I think six stats yeah. doesn't, I still struggle sometimes to be like, why are there so many of these things? Like, it doesn't feel sure. like we yeah. need one, you know? And there's a good reason for that is because <laughs> if you're, if you're familiar with games like, um, you know, like the storyteller system, uh, it's always like attribute plus skill is what it, what it wants you to roll when you're making a roll. Um, but in this game, you don't, you know, you don't need a bunch of, you don't need six or eight or whatever attributes right um to build up your dice pool right and it also means that there's less opportunity for your character to suck at something in a you know in a sure. way because like yeah. there's there's more things so as you can see here um you get a number of points based on how old your character is so if your character is a youngin you've got 15 points to distribute amongst those four stats whereas an older character might have 14 or 13. And you can see here that the minimum that you could put in is two so basically everything starts at two but you have to pay for it and you can put no more than four into an attribute. In other words, four is your max. However, if it's your key stat, they don't they don't spot you the one, but you can put it up to five. And if it's doubled up, you can go all the way to six. But obviously yep. that would be, you know, that would come at the expense of your other ability scores. Um, sure. So the key ability score doesn't give you a bonus. It just lets you spend more exactly. of your resources into one area. And that's kind of what I was getting at earlier is there, uh, you know, if you like, if you like character building, uh, theory crafting, there is something for you in this game because you can, you know, you can optimize your profession and kin selection to, you know, if you really want to hyper specialize in something, uh, the creation tools are here to, to allow you to do that. Yeah. I, I would also obviously Keep in mind, that's as Derek was saying, that's going to come at the cost of uh, versatility, your other right. skills, right? Which could also be a good point to point out that's like, well, if you have a really great party where people can shore up each other's sure. weaknesses, uh, that's a, yeah. a, a great thing that you can rely on. And we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but to, to, to put it bluntly, um, your zero engine is a D6 dice pool system. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be rolling D6s and you're going to be looking to get sixes. Yep. The number of points in your attribute, two, three, four, maybe five, maybe, maybe six. That's, that's how many dice that's you how roll. many dice you get to roll. Yep. So if I ask you to make a strength check and your strength is three, you're gonna grab you're three. You're rolling three dice. You're rolling three six siders. Yep. It's that simple. It's and and you're looking for a six. So uh I think one of the problems with dice pool systems is people can tend to not understand how the odds work. Um, and that mm -hmm. can be kind of difficult. I think they give you a chart in this book that shows you the they odds. They do, actually. <laughs> they absolutely do, which I think is very smart. No, I think I it's think smart that's too. very but, smart. You know, a lot of people go, oh, 
you need a single six? I'm rolling six dice. How could I possibly fail? It's like, well, if you do the math, you'll actually see that yeah. you have like, you're only like 75% likely to succeed. You're still very exactly. likely, but it's not guaranteed. Um, so skills are pretty yeah, enough. We, we haven't gotten into pushing yet. Um, yeah, we have not. Look yeah. at uh, Sean's comment there. <laughs> Uh, yes, there's even odds for pushing, yes, as well, which yep. we'll definitely talk about, which is what I think makes the game great. It's like the one thing that Ben keeps, like when people talk about Call of Cthulhu and they talk about the like the luck mechanic and how you can spend the luck, like I really yep. love that uh, if you're willing to risk something, uh, then you can maybe get another bite at the apple. I love those kind right. of mechanics. Basically, and push your luck, push your luck mechanics, right. It's, it works, the, it same works the same way in Call of Cthulhu as it does here as you you say, well, I don't like that result. I'm going to re-roll. But if I, if I fail, then, you know, bad stuff happens. It's right? worse. And, and it's, it's and, a cool yeah. moment for you as a player and as a PC to say, is this something that we as a group care enough about or that my PC would care enough about that they are willing to sort yep. of risk, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the penalties for increased chance of success? Um, yeah. so skills, skills work pretty much like you kind of D 20 based skills. Um, mm -hmm. and again, based off of your age, you can see that if you're older, you have more skills, you've been around longer, more chance to develop skills. If you're younger, you only get eight points. Now, uh, we showed, uh, Patreon 33, we showed that the character sheet here at the end of the book, um, you know, and again, we're not going to go through every single skill, but I love some of the symmetry of this. There are four skills for each of the attributes. So there are four strength skills, might, endurance, melee, crafting. That's right. There's no base attack bonus. There's no weapon proficiency system. Melee is the skill. It, you know, it, it'd be like in Pathfinder 2 if you had athletics, melee, crafting, deception, diplomacy. <laughs> it's just a skill that you take. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so there's four for craft, uh, four for strength. Might, endurance, melee, crafting. There's four for agility, stealth, sleight of hand, move, markmanship. Four for wits, lore, survival, insight, manipulation. And then, I'm sorry, uh, scouting, lore, survival, insight. And then four for empathy, manipulation, performance, healing, and animal empathy. And yep. you're going to put one, two, or three points into these skills just like you did with your uh, ability of attributes. And guess what? If you're doing that thing, you get to add those as D6 to your dice pool. Now, there's a little bit of a caveat to that. We'll get to that when we talk about pushing. But um, essentially, if you're doing a thing that you're skilled at, you get to add those dice to your uh, attribute dice pool. So if you had three strength or three might, I should say, then you would start with 3D6. And if you had two in your melee ability, well, now you're up to five. Um, yep. Do you feel like that is... <sighs> How does that, how does that mechanic strike you in comparison to say D20? Do you feel like it's more satisfying or less satisfying? So I like it because it's flexible. Um, and what it kind of reminds me of, um, uh, DM Samuel has been running a traveler game on Friday. And uh, a lot of the way you roll dice is kind of similar. You, you basically combine uh, essentially two of your uh two governing skills or attributes essentially and that's what you use to to roll um and it's very similar to like i said earlier the storyteller system i like the flexibility of it i like that kind of what the game in the book was saying earlier it's a conversation uh you say hey i want to can i use this attribute plus this skill to do this thing i'm trying to do and i'm trying to do it in this way and that's why i think this makes sense and you know your gm can say uh, no, I don't think that makes sense. Or, you know, they can say, yeah, okay, I'll buy that. And, uh, you know, you you do the thing. Whereas in like a D20 game, like especially PF2, where it's very, it's very prescriptive, right? Mm -hmm. You can, you, you can use this use skill athletics. to do this thing. Yep. You know, you can use athletics to climb. You can use athletics to, to shove. You can use it to do the, uh, you know, X, Y, Z. Uh, but it, it, there's this, there's this implication that, that's you all you can't, can do. <laughs> yeah. You can't, it, right. It's the classic, if there's a feat for it, right. then it implies that you can't do the thing that it allows you to do without that feat. Right. Uh, but that's why I like this because it, it's flexible, right? Yep. yep. So you can put up to three points into each, any of your skills. And again, you can go wherever you want. 
Because, I mean, think about it. A skill die is worth as much as an attribute die. So, like, if you, you know, if somebody has, like, I'm really strong, I have really high might, and you're like, yeah, but I put three points into melee, I'm still yeah. a very skilled fighter. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what makes that really cool. And then lastly, you get your talents. And talents are tricks and abilities that give you small advantages in the game. Their feats. Um, it's arguably they're kind of like yeah. powers as well sometimes. Um, each talent has three ranks. So think of it as instead of having it's like each talent is basically like a a feat chain of three talents. And so you can kind of put more points and kind of get better at that one talent. And of course, if your character's older, they've been around for a while, they get to pick three of them. If you're young, if you're whippersnapper, you only start off with one. Um, yep. And they note here that a special category of the professional talents are the magic talents. These are needed yes. to cast spells and generally only available to druids and sorcerers. And I think we should yep. note that going back to it, mm -hmm. there's no cleric here. It's uh, you want a cleric? If you want to be a healer, uh, you're you're looking at a druid. Right. There's druids that. and sorcerers. That alone yep. also feels very well. It feels very Nordic, um, mm -hmm. but it also feels very like primeval and old school yeah. in its own way. Um, then I will say, uh, yeah. Bitter Reach added uh, another type of uh, magic user called an elementalist. Or, okay, I did not. It's know like that. elementalist or geomancer, something like that. But got it. It's uh, real quick without you know. Getting too sure. into it, sure, it's sure. basically, uh, it's like a geomancer, right? The magic you can utilize depends on the type terrain, of terrain and the elements around. You can almost, almost, almost think of them as like a kineticist, right? Um, yeah. Except, you know, unlike a kineticist, you can't just pull elements out of your butt, right? You have to utilize the environment around you. Um, but that is that is the only thing uh, I wanted to mention was the uh, that other type of spellcaster. Got it. So now Very we cool. get now we get into the sort of the narrative one of the, one of the narrative elements of the game. So this is the pride, and this is basically saying like you are not like everybody else. Adventurers are not like other people. Leaving your home and family to set out on your way of the sword requires both courage and conviction that you are an individual beyond the norm. This is represented in the game by your pride, something specific that you are very proud of. It could be an ability, an event, something else. You you can come up with whatever you want. Your professional will give you some suggestions. Once a session, which again is a very narrativist concept or even mm -hmm. gamist concept. It's not once per day, once every 24 hours, right. once when the sun rises. It's once per game session. You can activate your pride when you fail a skill roll in a situation where you think your pride is relevant. Now, the GM yep. does have the final say, of course, but they and even says, but they should give you the benefit of the doubt. What, yeah. what ends up happening is you get to roll an extra D12 and add it to your die roll. And I should say before, when I said before, like you need sixes on your D6. Actually, what you need is six or more. Mm -hmm. So a D12 is giving you an extra seven shots on a D12 to get a six, a seven, an eight, a nine, a 10, 11, 12, which will give you more successes. Yep. So if you fail though, despite this really sick busted re ability, you have to remove your pride. You've been proven yeah. that you're not the awesome, you know, if you put like, if your pride is like, I am the greatest swordsman that ever lived, right? <laughs> yeah. And then you're, you know, you're fighting against a, you know, an, an, an orcish war boss, you know, war lieutenant, sure. and you miss, you know, and he's about to kill you. And you're like, ah, no, I am the greatest swordsman that ever lived. And you reroll your D12 and it comes yeah. up a one. You're like, ah, ah, shit, I guess I'm not, you know? And you yeah, lose. No, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's a similar vein. Like if you say, I am, uh, you know, I am the greatest hunter. Uh, in the land, you know, because, you know, hunting and uh, gathering food and your travels is a big part of this game. Sure. If your character goes on a hunting trip, uh, and we'll get into all these mechanics later, I'm sure, but, uh, you know, you you make your hunting rolls and you fail miserably and you're like, well, I'm the best hunter ever, so I'm going to roll my pride. Uh, and you still fail and you're like, like, literally what Derek was saying, well, well, crap, maybe I'm not as hot shit as I thought I was. Right. I feel bad now, and I'm bringing no food back to my party. And getting um, get, and you know, getting to sort of the, I don't want to say. Not so proud of that anymore. I don't want to say imbalanced nature, but the uncaring nature of this game system. Yeah. You have to go an entire session without your pride. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like, oh, just pick a new one. Sure. Like, yeah. no, like they the game assesses you a penalty. It says the next time you and your group get together to play, you don't even have a pride. Ever, you don't have this reroll ability. Your character has been sort of 
you know, had, had their ego checked. And there's they're kind of stung yeah, they're a bit deflated, a right? Bit deflated. They're, yeah. Yeah. So I thought that I thought that part was really, really, really fun. Um, and, you know, here here's an example of their character that they've been putting together. The half elf Nymeria, Nymeria, Nymeria um, mm-hmm. with their strength of three, agility of three, wits of five, empathy of three. They put some ranks into lore and melee crafting or sorry, melee and crafting manipulation. And then you can see for their talents, they have the psychic power. That's what came from their being a half elf. Remember, each kin or race or species gives you a talent. Yep. And then they got three points to put into Path of Blood and Lightning Fest. So um, the last parts of making a character are the sort of the other part of the narrative coin is your dark secret, which is, yeah, your character is a badass. They've got this pride, but your characters also carry with them uh you know, they're, they're, they're not perfect people. They carry yeah. a dark secret, you know, it, this yeah, sort you're, of, you're not the big damn heroes again. Like yes. you, everyone's got baggage. Um, and these are tools that you and the other PCs have for the GM to create experience with, but more importantly, they also affect how many experience points you get after a game session. The way to think about this from a narrative game mechanic is this is sort of like a personal, uh, a personal goal that might be at odds with some of the party goals that yeah. you can sort of pursue or, or sort of, you know, lead the party into trouble. It's kind of a fate point mechanic where it's like the, the game, the mechanics of the game are bribing you with experience points to sort of right. act in a way that might not be beneficial. Now I don't understand you really good role players out there are like, I would do it without being bribed with experience points. And I'm like, that's great. You're amazing. You're a better person than I am. You are, you are truly the, the bee's knees, but it's like, but look, Hey, if you're going to do it anyways, why don't I, why, I should, you know, if you were going to do the job anyways, but I was going to pay someone to do it, I should still pay you. So, sure. um, I, I like this mechanic a lot. I don't know how you feel about it. Um, again, this seems like something it, you wouldn't like. It is something I'm kind of lukewarm on. Okay. Uh, I will say. Okay. This is not this type of mechanic. Like, it's okay. Um, I feel like it's okay. There are other, uh, there's other weirdness, uh, social interactions in the system later, uh, regarding um, uh, the broken status mm-hmm. that we can maybe get into later if we have time. Sure. Uh, that kind of honestly, uh makes me go ooh, don't like that a little got bit it. more um, got it so like, whereas whereas, whereas whereas you already know that i love that mechanic <laughs> sure yeah um okay so again this is very much a sort of narrative forward mechanic in my perspective because it is rewarding you with game currency for playing and doing and acting in a certain way um sure. that is defined by your character um so then and the reason why i'm okay with this is yeah. because it's not really forcing your hand you don't have it's to do not- it Exactly. It's not forcing your hand. And to me, that that kind of makes it OK. Right. Like it's a little bit of a bribe. Sure. Whatever. But again, like you were saying, you you were probably going to do it anyway. Right. So and, what's the big deal? Right. And to be clear, that, that's what makes it a choice. Like because you might decide, yeah. no, it's not worth I I, I want to do what I want to do. I don't care about my dark secret. Like I want to do that. And the game goes, OK, you can do that. That's no problem. You know, but you don't get this experience point. Um, yeah. So then they have relationships and these don't have any mechanical effect in the game. They just make it clear that you want to have cool relationships with your people. I would highly recommend the backstory cards from Galileo games for this process um, because I just think it's really, really fun to have like a, a system to generate sort of backstory elements between you and your fellow PCs. Um, it's far better than you you met in a tavern um, and decided to adventure together. Um, I think that's really, really interesting. Um, in fact, yeah. In fact, having now gone through the Root Session Zero, these characters have a very vagabond from root esque feel to them. You know, vagabonds in yeah. root, you know, they are the only ones who will brave the forest. No one else leaves their clearing. And it's like, yeah, you're kind of like, you're kind of the badasses of the woodland and adventurers are kind of the badasses of, of the forbidden lands, which is kind of great. Right. Um, because even though the mist, the, the blood mist has lifted, like most people probably still don't want to go out there because they're very, you right. know, and, uh, comfortable right and, in their right. their lives you know and but it's, and it's still on the random encounter table um yeah <laughs> yeah yeah listen uh we we can get into that there's a lot of very spicy things on this table yeah there I sure think. is um so then you pick up some gear and uh without going too far into it um gear is represented by 
a die. Um, and uh, if you have gear that can help you with a check, then you get to add that gear die, it's called gear dice to your pool. So if you have like, let's just use an example, you have, you know, elven rope and your character is scaling down into the, the pit of doom and the GM calls for some sort of, you know, you're like, oh, I'm going to climb. He's like, well, you're going to have to make some sort of climbing check. You're like, okay, I've got three points in strength or might. I'm going to gather three dice. I've got two ranks in, I think it's actually called strength and I think it's called might. Uh, might, which is sort of the skill that represents you know, athletic ability. Cool. I've now got five dice and I've got this elven rope, which is a D six. So I'm going to add that to my pool and reroll all of it and, and roll all of it. And it's like, awesome. Like, cool. Like that's, that's how you determine a, a dice pool. Um, Encumbrance matters in this game. You will be limited how much gear you can carry. This is a game where you will Arrows aren't, it's not infinite arrows. It's not, it's not light rations equal uh, a light bulk of rations equals one week of rations. Um, yeah. Gear is really important here, but it also has a solid mechanical benefit. And that shit can fall apart. <laughs> your, your gear can oh, yeah. quickly wear away uh, to nothing. So we'll get to that oh, in a second. Yeah. Um. So again, I'm not going to go too much over it, but like I said, there is an encumbrance system. It's pretty simple. It's slots on your character sheet. If something, if something, something takes up one space in the character sheet, uh, or one spot on the character, if it's heavy, it takes up two. Um, and if it's light, it takes up half a slot and you just kind of, you know, pencil it in as you sort of draw on your, on your things. And the number of slots you have, I think is your strength score times two. So if your yeah. strength is three, you have six slots on your sheet. So you could carry six regular items, three heavy items, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Elia, talk to us about consumables here on page, uh, where are we at? Okay. 38. So, so this right. is really, because this is something that's really unique and interesting. And I think it is. for a lot of people who are interested in using Overland, counters, hex crawl, should really think about this system. Yeah. So we're talking about, we're talking about the resource dice at this point, right? Yes. Uh, we're talking torches, water rations. So as you as you travel over the hexes, and you, each time you travel a hex, it's a quarter of a day. Each day is kind of broken up into essentially like uh, six four hours. activity phases, right? Yep. Six hours. Um, and as you travel, you have to check, you have to roll a resource dice to see if uh, the remaining amount of resources, let's say rations, uh, depletes. Um, and so it, it's kind of you're tracking these resources, but you're not tracking them in a hyper simulationist way. It's kind of emulation. It is I would very, say. it is exactly how I would describe it. Um, Rather than getting into the super nitty gritty of how many pounds of salted pork and beef sure. you have, um, it just abstracts it with a die. Yeah, it, I wouldn't call it. I mean, I guess you could make the argument that it's gamist, but I think it's really more emulationist than gamist. And that's you're why still, yeah, you're I, still tracking a resource that exists in the fiction. Right. Um, and and you're not doing it because it makes the game better. Sure. <laughs> right. You're, you're doing it because yeah. it, this is a shorthand way because uh, fundamentally there are four resources. There's rations of food, there's water, there's torches, and there's arrows. Yeah. Um, and these can range all the way up from D12 all the way down to D6. And basically, every time you use arrows, you roll that resource die. Could be a D6, could be a D8, could be a D10. You could have a shitload of arrows, it's a D12. Yep. When you roll a one or a two, your die shrinks down one size. So if you had a D12 and you're shooting a bunch of arrows. Now right, you've got a D10. Now you roll a one or a two on that, boom. Now you have a D10. Yep. Still got plenty of arrows. Then that's going to become a D8. Then that's going to become a D6. And if you roll a one or a two when your resource die is at a D6, then you have depleted. You've used your last torch. You've then, used your last arrow. Yeah, exactly. And then you're out. And so you're out and you got to buy more. Or if you're uh, lucky enough to have a party member or maybe you have this ability as a talent, you can actually craft more. Yep. Uh, but that kind of gets into the crafting system of the game, which is all ties into the survival mechanics. It's 
Yeah, I would. It all I, feeds into each other. It's very it, interesting. It, it all feeds into each other. But another way I would describe it is like there's kind of a play pattern here of where like your characters will kind of adventure. And obviously, ideally, you'd be in the safety of a city. But, you know, it's like sure. uh, ships are safe in the harbor, but that's not what we build ships for. Right. Um, adventurers are safe in town. But no, you're you're designed to be out there in the wilds in this unchanged. This isn't like you said, this isn't Galarian. This isn't like where every five miles there's a rest stop and you can sure. get off and get a, you know, get a can of soda get, and, and a bathroom get a, get a, yeah. get a slushy you take a bathroom <laughs> yeah, get a slushy, grab, right. a, grab a snickers you know right. the, the truck stop you exactly know. there's none of that <laughs> and so the party has to become kind of self-reliant and exactly rather than come up with a million different ways to track all this they basically boil it down to food water light and ammunition and yep. what ends up happening is as a party it you need to have some way of restoring those resources otherwise you're going to run out and yep. that's where like crafting skills and foraging skills and hunting skills become really really important in this game in a way that if you're traditionally used to pathfinder second edition or uh, uh dnd might not really make sense because you're like why would anybody take hunting i can carry a month of food in my backpack and you know what exactly you are absolutely oh and by the way the town is two days away yep you're absolutely right there's no reason why you would ever do that. They have yeah. rules for it. They have rules for it in the book. Totally unnecessary. It, it is a it is an element of the game that it only pretends to care about that yes. it actually doesn't. Right. I, I've made that point before, and I'll make it again, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually completely agree. Um, this game, on the other hand, this may be a pro or a con to you, does care about those things. But rather no, than... No, I think that's a pro. Yeah, well... Because <laughs> I want... If these things are going to be in the game, they should matter. Right. Like, if they don't actually matter, get rid of them. Exactly. And just be honest about, you know, what, what your system cares about. Just realize that when you get invested into a game like this, though, you are setting yourself up for a situation where your party... Um, dies of dehydration like sure. you know as you're oh as you're, absolutely yeah like <laughs> as you're crossing the forbidden desert and nobody brought any water yeah. or you ran out or something and uh you know the resources there's a shit there's a really bad stretch where everybody rolls like ones and twos on their yeah. water resource die and the water yep. supply plummets and then you're all dead and yeah if that sounds you horrible to you you either like probably that not the right game you know? exactly like i, I think i could speak for both of us when i can say if that happened in my game as a player or a gm that would be awesome hell yeah <laughs> i feel like yes i'm here for this uh let's go i right I because agree. it without mechanics like that it like there's not much of an exploration pillar Absolutely. in my opinion well exploration anything in d and anything in D D or pathfinder anything in role-playing games sure it needs some form of of pushback or conflict to make it Attrition. interesting yeah so like yeah. when you're exploring in a game where you're like well what what is the only thing that's keeping me from exploring i don't know i guess time because the, the yeah. danger is non-existent the resource loss is non-existent so this yeah. game says look if we want to make this a compelling choice you know there's a reason why that's the forbidden desert and why the tower in the center of it is said to contain a king's ransom in gold and jewels because it's hard to fucking get to Yep. And if you could just cross the desert like it's no big deal, then it, it loses some of it, some of its fun. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So consumables are sort of this game. And again, if you're familiar with Quest for the Frozen Flame, I will absolutely say that this was part of the inspiration for that. For, we had four resource trackers, um, which sort of tracked the progress of the Broken Tusk tribe. Um, right. I think this idea can easily be lifted into many other type of games, but it works particularly well here in um in forbidden lands um yeah. so then we do our appearance just whatever for fun and then we finally we pick a name um and of course it, i can only speak for myself here but that's always the hardest part of character <laughs> creation for me you know what is it is a hard part for a lot of people i mean if you if you look bob didn't even create a, a name for his character in root yet He's, he was gonna have his kids do it and then they said no yeah. we're not we're not interested um so answering the third of Jaren Sorensen's questions, right as soon as we've done making our character, they put it right here in the book for us to read. Life as an adventurer brings many challenges, and if you survive long enough, uh, you will change and maybe even learn a thing or two. You receive XP at the end of every game session, talk it through, and let the whole group discuss what happened. For each of these questions that you can reply yes to, you get one XP. 
Yep. Did, did you show up? Yes, one. I get a lot of flack from people. People always were like, if you're reading this, you probably showed up. Yeah, true. <laughs> you know? uh, people always look at me like I, I'm on a different planet when I talk about like how like when I was playing DD 5e and we had like level one, level two, level three, level four characters in the same party. Um, yeah. Or like in Pathfinder Second Edition, how people are at different levels in my party. Because I'm like, if you weren't there, why am I giving you experience? Sure. Like, you didn't earn it. And it's like that. that I understand that that pr proves problematic in a game like Pathfinder Second Edition, which is very. It very, does Be uh, because it is very, very prescriptive and very gamist, right? It's all about balanced encounters and the game itself assumes that the party is all going to be the right. same level. And right. it really throws kind of a gear, a wrench into the gear of right. the the way you balance encounters when you have right. different I, levels. I, I've just, this game is different, right, obviously, but right. I get what you're saying. And even in Pathfinder second edition, I just care less about balancing the encounters even then. Sure. But, and uh, that's a valid attitude. That's a right. totally with, valid with attitude. With my players, yep. they don't mind. Right. But I can yeah. see other people might mind. Um, but in any case, you get an experience, experience point just for being there. Did you travel through at least one hex on the game map that you had not visited before? Boom. The game said it was about exploration. The game has given us mechanics that make exploration challenging and fun. Yep. And it's rewarding you. The for game is rewarding you. Look at that. You. Yep. Yeah, look at that. This 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 is enough of a reason for your players to sit around and go, hey, you know, we never went beyond those mountains. We should go yep. there because why wow, why? What, what's your character's motivation? I mean, I don't know, I'll make something up, but I want XP. <laughs> like, like I want to play sure. the game. And and if if you made a, a decent character, it should be easy to come up with character motivation. Right. Like, Right. You're character... already out there exploring. Like, exactly. You know, <laughs> Your character is supposed to be this, this sort of right. adventure. Did exactly. you discover a new adventure site? Did you defeat one or more monsters? Sure. Mm -hmm. You get a point if you kill stuff. But just one. It doesn't matter if you kill one yep. or many. Did you find a treasure worth <clears throat> one gold or more? Did you build a function in your stronghold rewarding mm -hmm. you for building? Like, you can't get that XP until you have a stronghold. So, like, Get, building up a stronghold is like a great way to start getting more XP. Yep. Did you activate your pride? Did you suffer from your dark secret? Did you risk your life for another PC? Did you perform an extraordinary action of some kind? This is the game saying these are the eight or nine things that we want to see out of you each, you know, not every session. It's probably unlikely that you're going to say yes to every single one on this list. Every right. single it's, session. It's saying these are the things we want to reward you for doing. Is what it's saying. Uh, Janka says, my kids were sick. Lol, give me a break. Just kidding. I don't have kids. <laughs> Listen, uh, you know, uh, I, I, that's that's one of my old school things. I, I just, I hate giving XP to people who weren't at the session. Um, I do want to say a couple things that we had uh, things uh, from before. Aaron said, um, I'm really considering trying resource dice in my next PF2 campaign. Try it out. Let us know how it goes. I think it'd be really, really cool. Um Janka says, I think D&D &D and Pathfinder 2 kept those pseudo simulationist elements as a result of tradition and just having rules for them so that the GM has a backup. A hundred percent. Yeah. They are just there because it's a sacred cow. Um, because sacred cow. Because exactly. sacred cow. Yeah. Um, when you get experience, what can you do with it? You spend it. I love spending XP. Mm, yes. Legend of the Five you Rings. Yeah. You don't gain a class level. You don't. Get a new spell slot. Like In fact, you, you, there yeah, like, is no level. That's right. There this, is no level. This is a level. You didn't see that on the character sheet. Um, yeah. I love spending XP. Legend of the Five Rings uses a spend XP mechanic. Um, I don't know what it is. Like, obviously, like, you you know, you level in, like, World of Warcraft. But, like, I always felt like getting talent points and then getting to spend the talent point was always such a satisfying thing to do. Um, and being able to do that with your experience points is really fun because you because can you're use making it. a choice. You're making a choice. You can, and it's not just oh, this number went up. I get these things because this number went up. You know. So you can use your XP to improve your skills and talents, or learn new ones. And you could do this during a quarter day. That's what uh, Alia was talking about with the four quarter days per 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 day. And yep. you have to use the rest or sleep action. So, you know, your character doesn't just like gain abilities in the middle of a, of a, of a campaign, um, to, to increase a skill, it costs as much XP as to the next level as you want to attain by five. So if you want to go from two to three, three times five is 15 expensive, right? So yeah. you can see where it, there's a, there's kind of an incentive to, you're like, well, 
getting getting it at level one only costs five XP, right? Like getting that first die is pretty cheap. Getting the third and fourth and fifth die. I should also point out, and this is something I really like. This is subtle, but this is like when you when you play a lot of games, stuff you start to notice. Yep. This, is, this isn't very dissimilar in some ways to Blades in the Dark. In Blades in the Dark, you need a six. But the only thing in Blades in the Dark is it also lets you succeed on a four or five. It's just, it's the partial success, right? This is essentially the same system as Blades in the Dark. It's where, except Blades in the Dark says, you need a six. You're going to get a dice pool. You're going to roll it. You're looking for at least one six. But if instead the highest die roll you roll is a four or five, we'll give you this success with complication. But I, I'm digressing. But like sure. it, I, For me, I find it reminds me of, I haven't played Blades in the Dark, but uh, I have played the uh, a lot of the White Wolf games, Storyteller sure. System, and it reminds me of kind of the way that works as you you get xp and you you know you you spend that xp to get you know dots of uh right, abilities dots. and skills and seven dots time celerity you, you every time 100 percent. <laughs> yep you know it's up yeah um and uh yeah it gets more expensive yeah you know, the higher rank you want to buy so it's here's similar. what's great about that is it, it and trust me on the math on this the thing is getting more d6s is good but it's diminishing returns once you yeah. going from one die to two dice is a big difference to your overall odds of succeeding going from five dice to six dice or from seven dice to eight dice. Isn't really that it's not really increasing your chances actually sure. that much. It's only a frat, yeah. only a couple percentage points. Whereas in D 20, every plus one is 5%. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what ends up happening is in D 20, uh, someone who is plus 10 to a, to a skill, versus someone who is plus five to a skill that is a huge gulf of difference between the two right but 10 dice versus five dice isn't as big of a difference as you might think hey yeah, gm scott appreciate the shout out from gm scott there gm um, scott in the chat happy to be doing this this is very fun uh love to see it love to see it gm scott says uh just got in thank you for doing this alia yeah thank you Elia. um have, always happy to have, of course, if you're a member of the Knights of Last Call Patreon at our hero tier or higher, uh, one of the perks is you don't have to. I'm not going to force you to come on the stream. But if uh, something of a stream <laughs> idea comes up and you're particularly interested in it or you want to hang out and talk with us, um, you are a, allowed or able to join us here from time to time. We've had Vin, Ben, uh, Donnie, Damien. We've had a bunch of patrons on. So uh, I think Edrol, uh uh, maybe Darth Gorlock was on. Um, so happy to have people on to discuss games with, especially someone who knows the system very well. So um, long story short, you could put all your XP into a skill and get it really, really, really high, but yep. that's not the necessarily the most, the best thing to do. Like, yes, it will make you the best at that skill, but it's diminishing returns. And that I like because it kind of punishes you for trying to be the badass. And I think that's really awesome. Um, so, you can also increase your talents. You can also change your pride. Um, if you if you failed and you went in an entire session without a pride, uh, you can you get to choose a new one if you think one is appropriate. Um, and also, if your dark secret is no longer relevant, perhaps that inner conflict has been revealed or the ominous threat has been resolved, um, then you can come up with a new dark secret from your GM. Sure. So very cool. I'm not really going to talk about reputation here, but needless to say, yeah, that's. That's a whole other thing. Uh, the, I, I feel like the TLDR of reputation is. I have actually have mixed feelings on the reputation mechanic, okay. uh, but the gist of it is is that as you do things, um, you, and this is a thing that is tracked. But basically, you your party has a reputation. Yes, and depending on your party's reputation, it might affect. Uh, the reception that you receive in villages and towns, uh, castles, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, it's basically and, like an old school reaction role. Sure. To and, your party. And it's this very binary thing of you do this, you get reputation, positive or negative, whatever. My, where I kind of, where my simulationist brain kind of uh, <laughs> has issues with this is like, okay, well, what if we do this thing? But no one's around to see it or report it. Well, they do. They do. Okay. They do right. answer that though. They said after a game session in which you have performed one or more great or terrible deeds of some kind, one, which will what one, which was made known to the world. 
Okay. And that, will no, be spoken fair. of for years to come. Sure. And Made and so I world. and I think that's the there. I think that's the key because I would agree with you otherwise because this is sort of one of those things where if you go and do this amazing awesome thing, but yep. it's it's out in the middle of nowhere and no one will ever hear about it, then the reputation score might be zero. On the exactly. other hand, if you return with the lost scepter of Marzabal and you're parading it through the streets of town, yeah. holding it, you know, we 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 took this from the, you know, and then behind you on a cart is the dragon's dead body and you're drawing it through, you know, town. Sure. That's that to me is how and I, and I don't necessarily know that that's exactly what they intended, but that is exactly how I would run it. Where 100%. I yeah. am right there with you. I agree. Um yeah. because you know, it, it it's sort of like, again, it actually is introducing another question of player agency. Hey, yeah. do we go for the this job or this mission or this idea sounds really cool, but it's not really going to get us any clout. Uh, but we could, could do this, you know, great service for the king. And that's going to give us a lot more reputation. Got another got another tip there. From, oh, from uh, Tayeo. Tayeo. Uh, yeah. It's actually Tayoyo, I think. Um, Tayoyo, sorry. Tayoyo. Every week, it's a new system I got to read, and I love it. Uh, this one seems really cool, but I'm now torn between running Versus D, Torchbearer, and now this for my friends. Those mm. are those are three games that are different, but are definitely occupying that same kind of old school space where they're trying to make things a little dangerous, a little vicious, um, and uh, but also kind of old school, but bringing in some new school uh, uh, things like Dark Secret and Pride really remind me very similar to mechanics in Versus D where, you know, you have yep. similar, I think the whole made, drive, the, the whole drive. drive thing. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's, those are games where you look at it on the surface and you go, oh, this is just an old school hack and slay system. And it's like, no, no, no. There is an undercurrent here of sort of story, sto you know, that, that it, I don't want to say the story is important. It's more like, we want you to embrace what this game is about. We want sure. you to be an adventurer. We want you to be a scoundrel. And I really, really like that. Um, okay. Now we're going to talk. Uh, we're not going to go through all the skills, but we are going to talk about the how a check is made. And I mm -hmm. think this is probably the most important thing that you can take away from this whole experience. Because this is kind of the, the heart of the year zero engine. When you perform an action, you describe what your character says or does, and then you grab a number of six-sided die equal to your skill level plus your current score in an attribute in that skill. And if you have some sort of gear that might be helpful, you will get extra dice from that as well. You roll all those dice at once. That is your dice pool. Sixes are good. Six means success. And in the dice they give you, with the if you buy the box set, they have crossed swords. Now, generally speaking, uh, the specific action or whatever you're doing, rolling more than one success could have additional effects. That depends on the skill in question. Sometimes it's just, did you do it or did you not do it? But if the question is like, how well did you do it? Right. Um, then the number of sixes that you roll is important. It can be, especially with things like magic, where sure. extra successes uh, you know, improves the effect of most magic. Correct. Um, and I think like if you're repairing something, I think like the more sixes you get, the more, right. the more, more repairing you did. Uh, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is what I love about this game. Ones wear you down. Ones can be bad for you. They aren't yep. guaranteed to be bad for you. It means that you've suffered damage, exhaustion, fear, or maybe your weapon or piece of gear has been damaged. Sure. Yeah. On your initial roll, ones don't mean anything. Okay. It's when you push. That's when it matters. It, you you just you note a one on your first roll is the same thing as a two, a three, a four, or a five. It means it's not a six, so it's not a success. AKA yep. didn't do anything for you. Um, on the special dice, it's marked with a skull. Now, one thing that they want to note here is when you play the game, you do need different colored dice for your d6 pools because one of the advantages of skill dice is uh, your skill can never get damaged by rolling dice. In other words, uh, you need to know which of your dice are skill dice, which of your dice are attribute dice, aka strength, agility, wits, and you also need to know what of your what of your dice is gear dice. The reason is, is because 
when you roll your dice pool, you have an option to re-roll your dice pool. And this is called pushing. Yep. Uh, so do you want to describe what pushing means? Sure. So when you when you push a die roll, it, it's kind of like if you ever played Call of Cthulhu, you re-roll your dice. Um, uh, but if you fail that roll again, uh, that's when those ones come into play and can really mess you up. Right. Either gear damage or ability damage, things like that. Correct. And I should note that from that initial die roll, anything that was a six, aka a success, or a one, that's locked. Yep. So if you have a bunch of ones already rolled, okay, you don't get to re-roll those ones. Right. You don't re-roll those. You, you are re already priced yep. into those things being bad for you. But then you only re-roll two threes, non one or a six. Yeah, only two, three, yep. fours, fives, and six. Or two, three, fours, and fives. Then yep. you roll those again, and now you can see, hey, did did I succeed? And the good news is, like that, it's going to give you a good extra chance to succeed. But, but, big but. <laughs> For every one that you now have in your final result, if that one is on a skill die, aka it came from your skill pool, good news. Skill dice are sweet. You can't lose skill from doing a, a, a task. They're, you're right. fine. That is the big advantage of skills. They're very narrow because it only applies to one specific type of action. Strength might apply to a variety of actions. But, you know, crafting only applies to crafting. That's a skill. So skills, you're safe, but if you rolled any ones on your weapon or gear dice, your gear or weapon becomes damaged. For yep. every one that you roll, the weapon or item becomes one degree more damaged. If you roll a one from your attribute roll, like let's say I had, let's say my strength was four and I roll four red dice representing my four points of strength. I end up with two ones on those four dice. And I pushed, only if I push, my strength takes two points of damage. Yes, my strength goes from four to two. Like, that's not like, oh, it's just, da no, no. For all, my, for all intents and purposes, my strength is now two. If I made another yep. strength check, I'd be rolling two dice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the death spiral. Is, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> this is where the death spiraling comes in because you can recover that damage, but you have to basically spend a quarter of a day resting. Right. And, like, and receiving that's healing. What you're, and receiving healing. Like, that's what you're doing is you are, you have to basically forego activities. And if you're in a position where, well, shoot, you know, we're running low on water or, uh, you know, rations or food. And we, you know, I'm still the best person that can potentially go out and get these things for us. Well, you know, you might just have to bite the bullet and, you know, put, you know, push your luck anyway. Um, right. So that that's kind of where the death spiral danger comes in. And this should start to make you question something if you're very, very clever, because you might say, wait a second. So your strength score, which we kind of, I think, in innately feel like, oh, that's hit points. Mm. But, mm. Ag but, <laughs> but agility yeah. can also get damaged. And exactly. your wits can get damaged. And your empathy, your empathy can, damaged. can get damaged. Yep. Any of your four stats can get damaged, which means any of your four stats can go to zero. And that is basically where the game says you now suffer a consequence. Okay. Yep, you, you are broken. You are broken in some yep. way. And this is important to note here. Like you can break from your strength going to zero and essentially being, you know, maybe dashed upon the rocks or smashed by a thing, but you, your wits could also be broken. You saw some ancient evil that man was not meant to know. And you're, you kind of went a little crazy. Uh, yep. And so any of your stats can break or go to zero. And that's really, really important to note here. And when that happens, guess what you're rolling on? A critical <laughs> table. Right. There is a, there is a critical table, <laughs> mm -hmm. not just for your body, but for your mind but as for well. For your mind. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it, it gets pretty wild. It gets pretty wild. So the good news is until that happens, you're fine. But once you yep. break, then you have to roll on this critical table. And the nice thing about it is it's not like, oh, you're dead. Actually, dying from that table is pretty uncommon. It can happen. But it yeah, can it's, happen. But yeah. most of the time, you're just going to get really, really screwed. And that's... <laughs> you're going to wish you were dead. <laughs> you're going to wish you were dead. And yes. again, that's part of the charm of a game like this. If that's mm -hmm. not what you yeah. are interested in, 
then it's not really going to uh, to be to be something you're gonna be satisfied with. Here's the uh, here's the chart that they provide for you because it's not always intuitive how likely you are to get a six. Right, we were talking about this chart earlier. So you can see, and this is what I was talking about: the diminishing returns. Like if you have nine dice in your pool and you add one more die to your pool, your chance of success goes up from 81% to 84%, a mere 3% increase. Whereas if you yep. go from, you know, two to three dice, it goes up 11%. So it's like literally, you know, three, almost four times as much of an increase. Um, so there's, there's sort of a diminishing returns to trying to put so much XP into one skill. It's like, once you get to a certain point, especially with pushing, you can see that you know, once you get five or six or seven dice into your dice pool, if you're willing to push, your chances of succeeding are 90%. That's really good. Yep. But realize that when you push, that's when you're going to take ability score damage. So it comes with that yep. price. Now, of course, you could be the luckiest son of a bitch alive and roll no ones, in which case, yeah, you made out. You, you did it. You're the, the best. All right. This is a rule. I'm. Uh, this is a rule that is pro I'm going to say this. Mm, this rule is potentially willpower. Here we go. This rule is potentially problematic, and I don't know that I don't like it because of that. But it is something that you need to be aware of. So, yeah. um, I need to step away for one or two minutes. Yeah. And uh, when I come back, I can provide my thoughts on willpower. Okay, I will talk about willpower. All right. Yeah, go for it. I'll be right. right back. All right. So the deal with willpower is willpower is sort of like your character's personal drive of resources. How much of a badass do you feel like? And whenever you push yourself, okay, for every point of, for every one that you roll, only when you push yourself, AKA you just took damage, okay? When you push yourself, you get a willpower point in addition to any damage you suffer. You know, there's kind of a Nietzschean, that which does not kill us makes us stronger sort of belief here. And the idea is, is that, you know, your character was willing to put their body or their mind on the line for what they believe in or what they want to accomplish, that makes you strong-willed. And so you gain these willpower points, which can build up and build up. You can have up to 10. This is why I like and dislike this mechanic. Because as a GM now, you have to be aware that some players might try to fish for willpower. Like, they might say like, oh, I'm gonna go get some water from the nearby stream. All right, I'm gonna go make a survival roll because what they're really trying to do is push the survival roll. It's not really that dangerous. Um, and they want there to be a roll so that there's a chance that they can build up their willpower. And you just have to be very aware of only calling for dice rolls when there is a potential downside, when there is a negative consequence that could happen. Because otherwise, you're sort of giving your players a free lunch. And um, that is something that, it's not that I don't like that mechanic. I'm an experienced GM. I am more than capable of saying, yeah, like, uh, no, we're not gonna make a dice roll for that. There's nothing really, you know, consequential about that. But I, sometimes I don't like that I have to make that decision. Um, it would be kind of sometimes nicer for me if this mechanic worked out a little bit better. I don't know how they would have made this mechanic work out a little bit better, but I just, sometimes I don't like that um, the willpower acquisition is kind of tied to the GM allowing you to make dice. This on its surface, again, I understand that people are, you know, some players are good and my players are really good. They would never abuse this. But on the surface, what this mechanic rewards or encourages is a lot of dice rolls. It makes the players want dice rolls because that's how they're going to get willpower. And I don't like, that's a perverse incentive. I don't want my players to be incented to try to make up a, up a bunch of dice rolls because if your willpower is really low, the only way to get your willpower back is either have a really bomb stronghold. That part I really like, um, you know, that if you have an awesome stronghold, you can get it back. I don't hate this idea, but I almost wish that willpower was more tied to um, like getting, uh, you know, like being in your stronghold or, uh, um, uh, you know, having a great night with your lover or spending a rousing night in the tavern, drink, singing songs and, uh, you know, and drinking ale, uh, kind of like your old school, like carousing or, um, you know, really filling your character's passions. And I understand that that's not like the case for everything or like having a great night's rest and a fabulous bath and, you know, hiring a, a barber to come in and, and shave you. And, you know, 
like this classic like adventurers spending their wealth uh like it's going out of style um yes exactly gm scott like it, it's very much like kind of a blades in the dark kind of mechanic where it's like if you feed into your vice you get willpower back that is kind of how i wish this mechanic was designed that there was sort of a more of a procedural element to it yeah people are definitely noticing that it, it it's definitely sounding like blades in the dark uh, what i was I saying back. is what i was saying is i don't this mechanic again people can play it the way they want but this mechanic creates a perverse incentive for players to want to spam die rolls yeah and now as a gm you have to be aware that the player is going to be like well i'm low on willpower the only way yeah. i can get this willpower is to make dice rolls so i'm going to be yeah. on the lookout to just be like hey can i roll for that hey can i roll for that exactly hey can i roll for that hey can i roll for that and i get good players won't do that but i don't like that now the player has to be like well but i kind of do need that willpower and i kind of need that so i should really look for a die roll right because it's not like in you know, it's not like in Pathfinder 2 where you get your hero points and, <laughs> right. you know, you get them at the start of the session, you get them every, it, it's not like that. You, you have to push yes. to get willpower. And that is kind of the problem you're alluding to. And I kind of see that as a problem as well, because it does, I feel like it does create this, like you said, for lack of a better word, incentive mm -hmm. for players to want to push, try to, try to push every role they can. Right. Because they're and, like, I might as well bank some willpower while I'm at it. Yeah, because that, especially if you are a, uh, if if you've got a type of character, like if you're, if you're a magic user, not even a magic user, if you're uh, even just a martial character that needs to spend willpower to make their talents work. Right. Uh, you know, you have an, you have a very, very strong incentive to want to push every role that you can. Right. Because you want to be and using those get, talents sure. as often as you can, right? Yeah, and it can get very narratively very awkward right uh in terms of like the, right because your players are gonna be like uh, oh uh, let me roll yeah. for that I, I i go to the top of the tree and i scout to try to find yeah. you know um uh, and as sean says you know um yeah you want willpower because it's gonna let you do some really cool stuff yeah exactly um, you need willpower game, to do the cool and, things. and to be clear the game wants you to have willpower i'm not trying to yeah. suggest that this should be some sort of like stingy scrooge mechanic where you don't hand sure. out willpower i'm simply saying that like for me as a play pattern, tying it to dice rolls is a little problematic. I wish it was tied more to like great victories or carousing in town or yeah. spending all of your money on, you know, research and lore and, you know, kind of like almost kind of giving you a reason to kind of throw your money away sure. to build up your willpower. Um, like, and I like the idea of like the willpower being something that gets replenished because sure. even in the game, it says you can gate. You know, you get it from pushing, but you can also get it from your stronghold, which I love right. because I love the idea that whether it's your stronghold or you're in town or whenever you're in civilization, that's kind of like your chance to like refill this, this resource of willpower before you go out into the wild. Right. And that once you're out in the wilds, it's hard to refill your will. You know, your will is yeah. being tested. You know, it's being drained by being out here. And the idea that you can just spam dice rolls to get it back is a little bit problematic yeah it's not just it's not problematic you just say no we're not rolling a die for that but now you're kind of in this weird situation where the players are like but i want to you know like and and that's the thing is, is the book so as far as i know technically rules is written yes you can always push a roll almost yes. almost uh, always push it, a roll. it says so you, if you already GM... have a success you can only roll you can only push a roll if getting more successes would have an impact fair. on the die roll which yep. to be fair a lot of skills do give you more effects on more sixes. Right. And you might run into, uh, to give you an example of this kind of like weird player incentive behavior, is you might end up with someone, uh, let's say you're traveling from one hex to another, uh, and you've got a player that says, well, you know, I'm really bad at hunting. Like my main thing is really, you know, casting spells or swinging my axe at, you know, bad guys or whatever. But I want to do the hunting anyway, because I need willpower. I know I'm going to fail this. Uh, but I'm going to push it so I can get my willpower so I can do the the thing that my character is meant to do later on. Right. And that and that's where it gets really awkward for me. It does. And also, and, it doesn't even necessarily make sense. Like there no, it are doesn't. there are games like Torchbearer, which re which reward you for failing uh, like uh, or like fate where you can be like, hey, I'm going to use yeah. my aspect against me because it makes sense that my character would, uh, you know, t you know, 
talk out of his ass in this moment because I've got the talks out of his ass aspect. And that's going to give me a fate point because it's a meta currency. But yeah. willpower isn't really a meta currency because it's it's kind of supposed to represent your character having this inner reserve yeah, of strength. It's, and it's almost like it's almost like a spell slot. Or it's like, like a, a spell slot. But like, yeah, but it's, why is my wizard sorcerer who's bad at hunting going out and doing a really shitty job at hunting? Making him fill up his willpower. That, there's yeah. a disconnect there, and I don't necessarily like that. You know. Yeah, and yeah, and I agree with. You. I feel like this is this is the one element of the system where I am most likely to alia finder the shit out of it. Yeah, uh, this is a hundred percent for lack of a better. Hundred percent. I have not gotten this game fully to the table as a campaign. This is 100% the one thing that I would probably house rule. Now, I sure. know people say, oh, Derek, that's so presumptuous of you. You you know, you, you should play 35 sessions. Look, this is not the Pathfinder 2 subreddit, okay? <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> this, how how dare you defile the sacred text? Right. You you know, know, the, you free league, the free league people are fine with that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I agree that this is potentially problematic. Um, all right, so there's some more information about the skills section. You know, you can change how hard or easy um, the game is. Or, I'm sorry, the role is. Um, in fact, it does say, and I do appreciate this, normally the GM does not have to assess <laughs> how difficult an action is. You only roll dice in challenging situations. So if it wasn't challenging, then you shouldn't be fucking rolling. And if it yeah. is challenging, it's enough that we have this one die roll. So this is very PBTA-ish, right? Where it's mm -hmm. like, there's no difficulty level in Powered by the Apocalypse. It's seven, eight, or nine is a weak hit. 10 or higher is a strong hit. Sure. But- this game does give you the option if you want to underscore external factors that you can have these modifications, which add or subtract dice from your dice pool based off of how hard or easy the task is. Yeah. So an extremely hard task might subtract two dice from your dice pool, um, which I really and like. I, I do want to say there are certain elements of this game where it kind of tells you like, hey, you should always call for a roll for this. Like, uh, you know, if you've got players that are out making hunting rolls for food or something like that. Like, uh, I think the game does pretty much flat out say, yeah, you should always have your players make these rolls, you know, even if they've got a D8, you know, ration resource and they're just looking for something to do during this period of the day. Right. You should still have them roll for that because what can happen is they could still potentially fail that roll, which I don't think we've really touched much on this aspect yet, but it could trigger a what's called a complication, mm -hmm. a hunting complication in this case. And there's lots of different things. You again, you roll on a table. This is a system that really loves its tables. Um, it's procedural which, in that way. Yes, yeah. it, it's procedural. And a lot of interesting things can happen, even if you didn't necessarily, you know, quote unquote, need that food. Right. Uh, like your your weird, like kind of fluke failed hunting role could turn into a session or two worth of adventure potentially depending right. on what what happens and which i think I like, that's really I, cool i i really like that too very emergent yeah. um <laughs> rpg musing says with a slash s of course just play a different game derek well number yeah. one number one uh i haven't played if I haven't, you change, derek if you change willpower you're not playing forbidden lands anymore what's wrong uh, with you? number one i haven't put this tape <laughs> i haven't put this game on the table as a campaign so you oh, technically i haven't played it at all and maybe one of the reasons why i haven't played it is because i would be like uh i'd have to change this and i don't know of a great way to fix you know to fix this issue secondly um i, I would agree with you only if i was trying to and i know you're being sarcastic so I, be clear. sure yeah i but, definitely am um what i don't like i don't mind when people change mechanics I don't, what I don't, when they feel like those mechanics are better served to the, the intent of the game, right? Yeah. And, and what, what are you trying, what kind of experience is the game trying to deliver? That is when, when, when you're trying to change the intent of the game. Sure. Right. Absolutely. When okay, you're trying to yeah. turn Pathfinder second edition into a slice of life, you know, Stardew Valley game. That's what it's I'm like. like what are you, what, what are, are you even, doing? Just what are we even doing Ryu, here? Go play Ryutama. Or go play Ryutama. Like, you know, exactly. And. I don't even mean that disparagingly. Nope. I, that's that's another game I would actually kind of be curious to see a deep dive on, but that's neither here nor there. But and GM Scott, GM Scott does confirm it. It's not a Luke Crane game. You are allowed to change it a little bit. Um, a little bit. Can yeah. a PC kill themselves while fishing for willpower? Technically, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. I mean, right? Yeah. Am, am I so, wrong? Yeah, no, a... you're not. So it's, and this is again where it kind of gets a little bit awkward. 
<laughs> a little bit awkward for uh, the broken status condition, right? Is, uh, and, you know, this can be like you're talking to, oh, let's say you're just conversing with an NPC, right? Well, you and should be rolling unless it's challenging. Okay. Okay. Well, well, sure. But like, let's say you're, you're in, uh, let's say you're negotiating with a merchant or something. You're, yeah. you know, you're, you're trying to get a better price. Let's, let's use that as an example. Right. You, you fail your, you, you, you know, roll a bunch of ones on your roll and you right. end up breaking yourself. Right. And it can be very, this is another part of the system that I would find challenging to kind of um, right. translate We're into the fiction is like, what the heck just happened there? Like, right. So I'm you're, to find where you're negotiating is. with this NPC for a better deal, but you've rolled so badly that you've done enough ability damage to yourself that you're now broken. Right. So like what happened? Did you, uh, you know, did you trip on a flagstone no, and get your clothes all wet or and right. you're just so embarrassed? Like, is that what happened? I don't know. So this um, is where I, I have less of an issue. Um, and so, I, I feel like I really have to reach yeah. in a really awkward way in situations like that. And so that's what I would find challenging. For about me, I, I, for me, this is just like, it's just like Legend of the Five Rings, where when a character sure, yeah. uh, unmasks. So yeah. in Empathy, it says, you break down in despair or self-pity. You must either explode in a violent outburst, kicking and breaking everything around with you, or withdraw from everyone around you. That's what broken empathy means. So in my mind, if your empathy breaks during that negotiation, you blow off. You I, And this is where, as a GM, I would feel compelled and even empowered to sort of seize narrative control of your character and say, you punch the guy in the mouth. Like a hard move, if you will. A hard move, a very hard uh -huh. move. Or I would say you insult him, his family, and you call him a you know yeah. a dirty, no low down, dirty scoundrel. He screams back in your face. You and your friends will never buy anything in this town ever again. And like that's now a narrative <laughs> truth because mm -hmm. you broke. There is this consequence. What I'm looking yeah. for is how can I take the fiction and get to an interesting consequence that's going to change the dynamic for the players, and in this case, for the worse. Um, and so for me, I look at breaking as sort of the opportunity to make a hard GM move. That's the way I look at it. One of those sure. hard GM's moves could be roll on the critical hit table and find out what happens. But it doesn't always well, have to be that. Oh, that's the thing. I, I think the game even tells you it. Uh, it, it, to use your terminology, it, the game demands that you roll on that table at that point, regardless of the situation, right? Um, if you, yeah, that I don't specific. I mean, if it's from combat or like being attacked, I, I imagine it does. So I, I, I would probably well, defer to the game at that point. I, I mean, in any situation, if you're just like you know in a social situation where you're negotiating with them, PC, pretty sure if you become broken for any reason, you have to roll on that critical table. You can ignore that obviously and say, well, no, that doesn't make sense. Which honestly. I might do that from time to time if I genuinely don't think it would make sense to do that, but yeah, it does, I, it does tell you that you should roll, uh, anytime you, uh, a, a player character suffers a break, hmm. I believe, unless yeah. I am misremembering something. Yeah. That I don't remember. That's what I was actually trying to try to look up here. Um, because the critical tables that they have in the book are critical injuries slash wounds. Mm -hmm. Critical injuries, blunt force, critical yep. injuries, stab wounds, and then they have uh, critical injuries, horror. So sure, I, I think I think it's kind of safe to assume that you're not going to like lose your mind and withdraw into catatonic nothingness from a failed negotiation with the merchant in town. Um, OK, I, I could be misremembering uh, that particular detail, uh, but. On the other hand, that, if you broke a lot of the a lot of the game does kind of call for that. Right. On the other hand, if you broke your, you know, your if your wits broke because you came face to face with a mummy and it, you know, unleashed its aura of despair and you became, you know, and I we roll and we're like, okay, you broke your your wits. Roll oh, two, yeah, 100%. roll roll D sixty six. And you 100%. know, your character can only sleep during the light part of the day. You're now afraid of the night. Like Cool. Like that, that feels very thematic to me. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I'm not going to try to let the game put me into a bad spot, you know, emotionally or uh, like narratively, like I, I, if, if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense, you know, but um, okay. So again, we're not going to cover every single skill. We kind of looked at them on the character sheet. They kind of do the things that you don't think. Um, this is something, uh, it's just a little sidebar that I thought I'd call out. I'm glad I, I can't believe I flipped right here to it. Sure. There, curious there, what do you got? 
so there is the first skill for wits, which is kind of like a comp wits. Remember, is an ability score that kind of represents intelligence and and wisdom. Yeah, um, it's scout, kind of a combination. You use your scouting skill to discover if anyone's sneaking up on you, or if you want to see if that movement in the distance is an you know an, a null war party. Right? There's a little sidebar here. It says, "Do not use scouting to find hidden things." The scouting skill is not used to find hidden things like secret doors or hidden clues. If you describe how your PC searches the right place, the GM should simply let you discover what you are looking for if it's possible to find it. So this yeah. is a very subtle little change here. But what they basically made is with scouting, they were like, look, if there is a something coming at you from 10 miles away. Get your game as perception checks out of here is kind of get, what it's saying. Get your like, game as perception checks out yeah. of here. Yeah. If, because, if they're looking in the right place, you should just give it to them because right. they're looking in the right place. Yep. Exactly. So uh, it's just a kind of a quick little side note that's kind of a little bit different. The other thing I want to call out is the skills that are related to empathy. Um, healing is one of the skills of empathy. And one of the yep. things that you can do with this skill is heal someone with uh, of their damaged strength or agility. So the skill basically is how you recover their their broken abilities. But there's another skill in empathy called performance. That's right, the bard skill. That's how you heal people's damaged mind and yeah. spirit, right? Yeah. So if somebody has damaged empathy or damaged it's wits, talk. it's a pep, it's a it's a beautiful performance. It's a yeah. it's a music that is soothing the soul. It's it, an uplifting Dis uh, yeah. Disney musical number, song exactly. and dance, right? Yeah. It is so cool that they made performance into a healing uh skill i love this part of this game and i love the yeah. idea of like somebody you know you're around camp for the night and everybody and somebody's looking really haggard and weary you know their soul is aching they've seen a lot of crazy shit today you know they've taken a bunch of damage to their wits and to their empathy and you know the character maybe that maybe maybe it's the minstrel maybe it's somebody who has ranks and perform they you know pull out their flute or they start singing a song and it just yep. lifts you know uh everybody's spirits um you know, yeah, it's yeah. like in um, I don't know if you've ever watched uh, like Stranger Things or whatever, but it's like when the, you know, people get kind of sucked into the upside down and they, you know, put some headphones over their ears and hey, here's a favorite song and it kind of sure, uh, sure, sure know, pulls them back and kind of restores their mind almost. That's kind of the vibe I get, right? Absolutely. Um, and I, I just think it's it's here's why it's just, it's very evocative. Um. This sure. is this is not you know Pathfinder Two is a similar way, but this is is much more slow paced, of course. But healing in this world is is you know it's more about like taking your time and being wounded and being healed yeah. and uh you know people talking to you and listening to you and singing to you. It's very Tolkien esque in that respect, and I really uh I really thought it. Um, Ryan says cool comparison. I wonder what the Kate Bush song of this world is. Uh, that's that run, that's that running up a hill song yeah yeah um i don't know what that would be <laughs> in forbidden lands yeah. you know interestingly do i have it forbidden lands comes with a uh i can see clearly now the mist is gone i don't know <laughs> forbidden lands comes with a at least mine did i kickstarted it it comes with a soundtrack yes it does um i'm playing it actually... now you won't be able to hear it ayla but Oh, I have it on. Uh, I bought the the Foundry module, and it comes with uh, the music as well, and it it is very good. Yeah, so that it actually does have its own uh, soundtrack to the game. <laughs> yeah, it's got like twelve or thirteen tracks. I don't know that it's. Uh, it's. I mean, it's. It, it's, it, it's they're it's, pretty good. I mean, it's cute, but it it's got this, you know, kind of cool, desperate, dark, rain soaked, yeah. like kind of like yeah. grim, but but somewhat like hopeful. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's a really cool track. And I feel like a lot of those kind of vibes capture like kind of the feel of the game. It's, Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's kind of, it, it's a little bit gritty, uh, but it's also kind of adventurous, right? Yes, um, absolutely. And I think that's, that's a really, that's a really nice balance to strike. So D priest says, I'll make a man out of you is a Disney song. And it's super motivational. That was actually the, when you mentioned the Disney song, that was a hundred percent the song that I was thinking of oh, in really? terms of like, uh, you know, healing somebody with a Disney song. Um, so talents. I haven't seen that movie in forever. Uh, Mulan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, 
So the talents are basically this game's feats. You can see that each of the professions gets three talents, which are sort of unique to that profession. This is your yep. class niche that you yep. get. You can also see that that each of the kins, each of the species we talked about before, gets a talent that you get to start off with for free. Uh, and then there's a, a fairly long list of what they call general talents, which anybody could pick up. So anybody could pick up ambidextrous or axe fighter or berserker. Your minstrel, your peddler could pick up berserker. It's not something that is limited to class or profession in this case. On the other hand, uh, you know, path of poison, path of the killer, path of the face, those are rogue talents and only a rogue professional can take them. There might be something in the game about like if you do something special or extraordinary, you might be able to gain a talent from another class or profession. But for the most part, that's kind of like what you, you know, what you can get that is only for you. And here's some more yep. general feats, uh, general talents for people to look at. Now, as I said before in the beginning, each of these talents comes in several ranks, three. So, yep. you know, when you have the path of the blade as a fighter, you actually have that at rank one. And whenever you hit in close combat, you could spend a willpower point, those things that we just spent 20 minutes talking about, to find a weakness in your opponent's armor or natural armor. The armor yep. has no effect against your attack. So it's an armor penetrating hit. That's what you get for rank one. If you go up to rank two, if you invest more XP into the path of the blade, <clears throat> then once you've used up all of your actions in a round, you could spend a willpower point to immediately attack one additional time in close combat once around. Yep. Here's where the this is where the crunch in the character building aspect of this game comes in. So, right. you know, if you're someone who likes to play Path Builder, uh, <laughs> you know, this this game kind of has it in a in a certain way. Um, it, I think it's there. I do. And then um, lastly, uh, rank three, the path of the blade. Whenever you hit, after you've hit, you can increase your damage. For every willpower you spend, you can increase the damage by one. And you might be saying, well, that doesn't seem that great. Well, remember, if your strength is three or four, you only have three or four hit points. Um, if if somebody does an extra couple points of damage to you, that could break your character, which would take you yep. out. So, I mean, now obviously, this is a dark and scary place and there are far creatures that are far scarier than any man. There are creatures that might have strength scores of six or seven. Um, but like there, I don't think there's anything in the game that has like more than 10 and that might be like a greater dragon or something. So like, I think the most hit points that something has in this game is seriously like 10. <laughs> I might uh, for, uh, for whatever you want to call hit points. Yeah, um, uh, strength score. But yeah. Yeah. Strength, sure, yeah. Yeah. So um, you can see where this could be really, really powerful. Basically yeah. is what I'm saying. Um, if you're willing to invest in it. So, and again, there's three for each with three ranks each. And then on top of that, you have all of your general talents and by dexterity, brawler, ax fighter, builder, defender. And by the way, some of these are not combat things. Like if you have builder, it makes you better mm -hmm. at building strongholds and you're like, yeah. Oh, that's just fluffy bullshit time. No, no remember, remember no. how, remember how strongholds let you regain willpower for free. Remember how strongholds let you gain additional experience points by having a badass stronghold and adding features to it. Like, no, yeah. this is a part of the game. That's what makes this such a different experience from some of the other games that you might be familiar with because these parts are all integrated into the actual mechanics of the game, which makes it yeah. really, really cool. Strongholds are so damn cool. It <laughs> I know. There's so much you can do with them. Uh, we could probably spend another half an hour, hour talking about strongholds. <laughs> yeah. Now, of course, they're really cool. You know, it's nine o'clock and uh, I, yeah. I, I already talked that we're probably going to go a little later, which is fine. Um, we're not going to get a chance to go through every uh, thing in the book today as it is a deep dive. And if you're familiar with this channel, you know that sometimes our deep dives take <laughs> sometimes up to three sessions. Um uh, a so, deep dive is gonna gonna be deep, right? Uh, like a deep dive is gonna know, be deep. I mean, we're really trying to kind of really not just go through the book. I mean, even then, we're skipping over every single you know talent. Sure. But, um, you know, but, luckily, you know, we're not doing ten minute clickbait here. You yeah, know? exactly. Um, I do want to talk briefly about combat. Yes. Um, I was going to make that suggestion as we should uh, talk about the combat system because it. This is, I feel like this is one of the crunchier parts of the game. Right. It is. It's um, 100%. And to be clear, it, uh, this is where I like the crunch to be in the combat system right. in these kinds of games. 
Right. I this is a, the combat system is a little too crunchy for me. I don't dislike and, it. And yeah, and I know this is where you and I probably disagree a little bit. Right. Is I I like my combat system to be crunchy. <laughs> uh, great role playing, Debbie said. Uh, whatever Derek just said, I disagree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There we go. There we go. Uh, Sean says, not a huge fan of initiative. Well, so the first thing is, um, I don't like initiative anyways, but um, sure, I can't really do that. I, I, I can, it's got this weird, is, it's got I, this I weird, it you draw cards yeah. from your hand um, and then you, you, uh, you do a new initiative. Um, uh, you do it, draw it once at the beginning thing, but instead of rolling dice, it's just one to 10. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, there's no, like, it's not affected by your stats or anything. Um, so it's kind of like you just get, you know, a one through 10 from, or an ace through 10 from a deck of playing cards yeah. and you just hand them out to people. So it's at least really quick. I will give them that, you know? And you can optionally add more cards. Like you can have a one to 20 deck. Like the point is you're you're kind of drawing random initiative either way right. uh, but and I, I, there uh, there are ways that you can get a little bit of an advantage and manipulate it there are certain talents you can take that right. lets you draw two cards and take the, yeah. the better one that Sur kind of thing uh, surprising your opponent mm -hmm. lets you draw yeah. two cards and you get to that pick too, which, yep. and you get to pick whichever one you want which again it's pretty cool it's like a fun way to be like oh look how this uh, i'm i've got the drop on them so i have a better shot at getting a better initiative um, yeah. And I like, I, I, don't, I don't, I like that little interaction. And again, it's quick. It's okay. Yeah, uh, it's quick. It's okay. It's the cards. So I at least appreciate that it's not like t seven people are rolling dice, adding a bunch of modifiers, which may or may not change depending on whether somebody was scouting and you have, right. a, you know, floating plus one, but don't forget about my fighter plus two. Yeah. But that's a circumstance <laughs> bonus, which doesn't stack with my scouting bonus. So wait, my fighter doesn't get to yep. go faster because you scouted. Shouldn't I, that still help me? No, it doesn't. They're both circumstance bonuses. Anyway. Oh wait, no, I have this feat. So I get this bonus actually. Right. I forgot I had yeah. heroism <laughs> cast on me it, and this is technically a perception go. check. So mm -hmm. that's plus one status bonus that yeah. does stack. So my initiative is actually too higher in the initiative. Well, okay. I don't, was the, what was your initiative? I don't remember. Okay. Well, does it matter? And then like the person goes, fine, you're going first. And they go, I delay. Uh, yeah. And, and, that, and that's, <laughs> I've always, I have, this is, this is an issue. I've this is just me bitching initiative. about initiative. I no, I, I get it. One of the issues I've always had with initiative is that your initiative doesn't really matter right. beyond the first round. And it matters even less in Pathfinder too, because like you said, like you can just delay. Yeah. And exactly. Uh, so I, I will agree with you in that sense is that that is an issue I have with initiative, but it's not, um, to me, it's not an issue that I'm like incredibly passionate about it. You know, I, I'm not on a crusade to get rid of initiative or anything, but you know, I, I do acknowledge that it has some issues. Um, and like I said, I can take it or leave it. Um, I'm kind of okay with initiative, but right. I also like phase systems. Sure. Uh, BSD does a great job of that, uh, but yeah, it, I, it's it's something I can take or leave. Yeah, I did. I, I ran my mm -hmm. um, last fifth edition campaign using a phased initiative system. Uh, you know, uh, I think it was ranged, then movement, then melee, then spells. And yeah. that, that was really that was really fun. That worked really well. Sean with a two dollar super chat says that I assume that he was talking about my depiction of what it's like rolling initiative in Pathfinder second edition. Uh, he said that was perfect. <laughs> and yeah, then GM Scott. Is. Uh, being uh, being the good uh, custodian of uh, of knowledge, it says just to clarify a previously uh, previous question: you only roll on the critical damage tables for strength and wits, not for agility and empathy. So there you go. All right, so you, cool. So, so only if your strength good is broken or there. if your yep. wits is broken do you roll with yeah. that. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah, Sean, you needed that delay. If you didn't have the delay, that that is that's the piece yeah. de resistance. You know, that's what makes it beautiful. After after spending five minutes deciding what the initiative order is, all the PCs just delay to the you know the last person, anyways. Right. I mean, if you <laughs> if you didn't if you haven't rolled a nat twenty on your initiative and delayed until the end of the round anyway, <laughs> what, you haven't really yeah. played Pathfinder two yet. Yeah. My favorite is a swashbuckler. We had a swashbuckler in our group who had the uh, you go first feet or go first feet. You know what that one is? Uh, yes. You, you first or you something. You first. Like that. You yeah. go last and gain panache. So he'd be like rolling his initiative and he like. You first. And it's like, what are we even doing here? Um, just go last. Oh. Why are you rolling the initiative? Um it gets it gets even better when you have a swashbuckler and a chrono skimmer in the same party. Who gets to go last most? Who gets to <laughs> yes. go last most? <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> who gets to go the most last? <laughs> um, it, it gets very silly. Ooh, and GM Scott, that's a see, and to be honest with you, I'm happy that these clarifications are in the rules, GM Scott. He said, and even when it comes to wits, you do not roll on that critical hit table if you broke because of pushing. So yeah, in other okay. words, you can't push yourself into catatonic Cthulhu sleep. It's only <laughs> if something damaged your wits. Would that happen? Oh my God, this is the worst deal ever, ever and just falls over and just flails or something, oh, you know. Ryan, to be clear, <laughs> I absolutely love that feat. In fact, After You might be my favorite after, Pathfinder after 2. You, that's what it's that's called, what After it's You. Called, yeah. Not you first, but After yeah. You is probably my favorite Pathfinder second. I don't even like the Swashbuckler class. After You is might be my favorite Pathfinder 2 feat. It is super, because it, it fulfills all of my cat. It's a useful tool with a reasonable cost. I'm going to go last in the first round of combat and I gain panache, which is something I want. So there's a cool trade off there. And it's so flavorful, not only with the name just in general, but with being such a baller swagger swashbuckler move. No, no, you do your thing first. I'll wait. It's so awesome. I love that. I actually love that feat. Um, anyways, so you draw your cards, you get your initiative. We go one to 10 on yep. your turn. You get a slow action and a fast action. And you can use your uh or two fast actions. So basically it's like you get a you get a major action and a minor action, but you can use your major action to do another minor action if you want. So you get one major, one minor, or two minors would be the way I would kind of describe it, right? Yeah. Um a fast action is quicker and doesn't always require a die roll, but might require a die roll. Um, see the lists of typical slow and fast actions on the next page. Um, so slow actions are basically your strikes, whether it's with a spear or a sword, it's grappling, it's shooting with your weapon, it's casting a spell, yep. it's charging, it's healing. It's basically the main action on your turn. You're going to get to do one of these per turn, yep. which is which is pretty cool. Um, I, I, I like that. It's like, there's not really a whole lot of ways that you're going to be able to do, uh, you know, these multiple times fast actions or that minor action. Uh, number one, I like the idea that they said, I, I, I would prefer if this was a hard rule that doesn't ever require a die roll because that way there's never a situation where someone's rolling two dice rolls in turn. Um, but the fast actions are all things like, uh, uh, you know, movement, um, setting up your shot by aiming, you know, if, if, a, if you're a range character and you don't have to move, you can aim and that allows you to get a better chance of hitting with your range shot. It also gets into dodge and parry. Yep. Which is pretty important <laughs> in terms of how the game. Pretty important. It, yeah. In terms of how the game resolves, because again, I'm not going to get super, super into it. Um, but what ends up happening in close combat is. You are going to uh, 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 be attacked and people are going to try to, uh, you know, do damage to you. But if you dodge or parry, um, the defender must declare if they're going to dodge or parry before you roll for your attack. Dodge and parry are called reactive actions since they are performed immediately and they break the normal initiative order in the round. However, they do count towards your two available actions in the round. One slow, one fast. For every yep. reactive action you perform, you get one less action. Now, when this game came out, I was very mad about this. Because, really? Yes, because they this is much. It's not. It's not 100 the way I would do it. But this is the kind of combat system that I had been trying to build in Pathfinder One, using ah. a reaction reaction based combat system. I see. Where basically, I like the idea that a character had like four or five actions a turn. But defending was entirely a player-driven role, which meant that if you used all five actions on your turn to move and attack, you had no actions left to be able to defend yourself or parry yourself. So it's like you went all out on attack. Whereas another character kept up their, you know, they didn't really do a whole lot. They've got three or four actions left at the end of their turn. They can use those three or four actions to dodge and parry and, you know, hold off a bunch of foes. And I like the idea that that what that did is it made multiple foes very scary because yes, you're just a, mm -hmm. you're just a mortal, you know, you're just a woman, you're just a man, 
you're not gonna be able to fight off. If 20 people surround you, you're not dodging and parrying all of those blows. If, you, if it's me okay. versus one or two people, I can hold my own. But if I'm outnumbered, I run out of actions to dodge or parry. Um, so you, you can only pay attention to so yeah. many things coming your way at any given time. Yeah. Exactly. So what ends up happening is if you dodge or parry, then when someone attacks you, you get to roll your roll. And for every success or six that you get, it eliminates a six from their attack. And what I'm trying to get at here, and this is kind of an idea important, is this isn't D&D &D with AC, okay? Armor no. is helpful for keeping you alive, but it's <clears throat> way better just not to get fucking hit. Yep. You don't have that many hit points. And honestly, armor is a random die roll. It may not even defend you. <laughs> it may not even absorb that much damage potentially. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of times what keeps you alive in a fight is your character parrying with their sword or their shield, dodging yep. attacks. And that's going to eat up how many actions you have available. And so if your character is getting attacked by multiple foes, you're going to run out of these reactive actions pretty quick. And yep. then you're going to basically be on the back foot. And then it's going to be just there. All they have to do is get a single six. Yeah. And then you're hit your, your skill. And there's no AC is what I'm saying in this sure. game. Dodge and, and parry are how you have AC. And one thing I've noticed about these kind of OSR style games is yeah. um, this is really where ranged characters have a big advantage because they are, you know, they're in the back, they're shooting people and they can just do that. Like, you know, um, yeah. And there's nothing you, you really kind of have to get up in their face to keep them from doing that. And especially in a game like this, where if, if you're, sitting there getting peppered by ranged attacks uh you know maybe you take a, a point of ability damage strength damage uh here and there well suddenly you you are less capable of you know hitting the person right in front of you as you said that's dodging and parrying right um right. so and i've noticed this about these kind of you know old school inspired games is that ranged characters actually have a very distinct advantage right which feels like an kind of modern games where it feels like it's balanced somehow like it, or yeah. even or they're even weaker uh, the, right that's what i was getting at is it like it feels weaker uh, and that makes modern, sense because game. going back to what you were talking about at the beginning of the game ammo is a resource yeah it, it's going to diminish if range attack better be powerful else why else am i choosing a character that is sort of inherently limited by how many sure. arrows I have. Uh, you're not going to run out of, I mean, my bow could break, your sword could break, but you're not going to run out of sword swings. I could run yeah. out of arrows. And in that case, I won't be able to attack anymore the way that I've, you know, specialized my character. So yeah. I better get something back for that. I better get something for that. Pathfinder 2 and games like it realize that, yes, technically you have arrows, but like most people put 150 arrows or whatever on their character sheet because it's like less than a bulk. And sure. it doesn't, it's not really, it's a resource, but it's not really a resource. And, and so it doesn't Fro matter. Frostjack makes a good point there. And, you know, at the same time, getting rushed, like as a ranged character is pretty scary if there's Absolutely. nothing standing between you. And so uh, it, it really is an interesting, uh, yeah, and, interesting thing going on there. In and without terms getting of, uh, too tactics. into the, yeah. And without getting too into the weeds of it, there's a little bit of like torchbearer rock, paper, scissors here. Because like if your opponent slashes, then, it's really uh, uh, it's easier to dodge it, but if your opponent stabs you, it's easier to parry it. Um, yep. And so, like, there's kind of like a did you use the right defense against their weapon? You know, um, if someone has a, a, a spear, it's much easier to parry that than to dodge that. As an example, yeah. Of that. Um, so it's almost kind of the same logic that went behind like uh, the reasoning behind why uh, magic was it's been traditionally so powerful in like second and third edition 100%. right is, well well it's a limited resource right there's spell slots right you know they you know a fighter can you know swing their sword endlessly but you know it's a you know a finger wiggler only has so many times they can wiggle their fingers and so many slots to spend yep so therefore their spell should be more powerful obviously that was that ended up being problematic for various well, reasons it but became problematic because the, what the truth of the matter was the way that most people played and certainly the way the adventures were written, uh, people would just go back to town and sleep and yep. get all their spells back in yep. this game. You can't do that. You can't do oh. that. 
And you so, have to make camp, but that carries inherent <laughs> risk, right? Absolutely. And also, it's too, not a free lunch. Exactly. And you run out of willpower. It's not like I wake up the next day and I have 10 willpower ready to go to cast my spells. Yep. Um, I don't wake up the next morning and automatically have a D12 ammo die. No, like if it was at D6 yesterday, you have a 33% chance every time you shoot your bow of being out. <laughs> I'm empty. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. that's cool. I mean, that's scary, but it's cool. I mean, it just makes those resources that much more important, which is why if ranged combat does feel a little stronger or if magic feels really powerful, it's like, well, yeah, but like the limitation on it is a real limitation here. Um, so the end result is, you know, we were like, oh, there's only four ability scores and all you do is add some dice rolls together. Combat can be a little crunchy. And actually there isn't, there is advanced close combat, which, uh, oh. which I wouldn't touch with mm. a 10 foot pole. You um, know what? I wouldn't either. Okay. Not going to lie. Okay. I, I read through it. It it's it has some interesting ideas, but it looks so clunky. Clunky. It's very clunky. Very it, clunky, very slow in it. If you're going to do it, I feel like you really want to do it in it like a 1v1. A yeah, it's perfect for a duel. You know. Yes. Duel of the fates kind of duel situation, of right? Yes. Yeah. Outside of that, my my recommendation personally, don't touch it. Just use the standard combat rules. Yep. They're crunchy enough. They're crunchy um, enough. I mean, yep. it, are the combat rules in this game as crunchy as Pathfinder 2? No. no. But but no, you will find not. that you have enough fun options <clears throat> and yeah. even just the even just the simple decision every time e each round where you go, hmm, do I want to dodge or parry this attack? Because if I do dodge or parry yeah. this attack, I will have one less action available to me in my next turn. Right? And so like yeah. that's like a big choice. And you're like, ah, oh, this guy looks pretty weak. I don't know. My armor's pretty good. Or, oh, I'm getting low. I have to change mm -hmm. up my actions. Are you going to be able to heal me? Maybe I don't care as much. So there's like a, yeah. a, a fun kind of balance to that. But yeah, I would completely skip the uh, thing. But um, I, I, I do want to go maybe about another 15 minutes. Um, yeah, sure. So this game specifically does call out here on page 98, social, yes. conf social, social conflict. conflict. Okay. Here we go. Sometimes you make things go your way without resorting to violence. Instead, you trick or convince your opponent without drawing your weapon. This might even be possible in the midst of combat, if the GM judges it plausible. For nonviolent conflicts, you use manipulation skill. When you ask, what you ask of your opponent or what you want them to do must be within reason. No NPC will agree to do anything or act completely against their interests, no matter how it's good. It's not mind control. No, it's, it, there's another line earlier, I think, when they're describing manipulation, they use that exact <laughs> term. They say it's not yep. mind control. It's not mind control. Um, this gets, this is very much like uh, disposition trading in Torchbearer or Burning Wheel, um, where basically you have to sort of negotiate the role. Yeah. Um, and if you successfully manipulate your opponent, they must either do what you want or immediately attack you with physical violence. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's so funny to me for some reason. <laughs> I, I, I love it. I love it. So civilized folks, you know, monsters are just going to attack you, but you know, civilized folks are just going to come after you. Um, and there's basically a variety of factors. This is where like the play in role playing game come in. Like, it's not just my dice, my, my character sheet versus your character sheet. It it's like the way you're playing the game matters because for example, if you've helped your opponent previously, well, that gives you a plus one bonus to your die roll modifier. If you're trying to, you know, strong arm them and you have more people on your side, that's another plus one die to your, to your, your modifier. And I mean, yeah. and this isn't a list. Um, you know, they don't specifically say that this list is everything that it could or would be because it even says. Right. The last one is you present your case very well. Right. Which is sure. worth yeah. a further plus one. And so what this game is saying is rather than the GM just go, yes, they are convinced. No, they are not convinced. They still want you to roll the die, yep. but they are accepting and acknowledging that a lot of these factors, including how well you presented your case and how strong your argument is, yeah. should have an influence on that die roll. And and that's where I have very mixed feelings about the system because I I, I appreciate that they acknowledge that that is important, uh, but at, you know at the, at the same time, this still kind of treads into the territory for me of feeling a little bit intrusive. Uh, right. I see what it's trying to do, and I would, I would play it to see how it plays. Um, before I decide to, you know, change it or ignore it or anything like that, I always like to, you know, give things a, sure. a good trial. Um, but yeah, I, I do have kind of mixed feelings about the way that works, uh, which is better than a lot of the time where I just look at something and go, "Ooh, 
no, get that out of here. Right, you know? right, right, right. <laughs> so it, um, it's it's it, it's an interesting uh, balance that it's trying to strike here. Frostjack says, is there any game that you would compare the combat crunch like level to or with? Um, that's a great question. Um, I feel like that's more of a question for you because you've played a lot more games than I have, quite frankly. So you yeah, might have it, a better idea. It's of... not Pathfinder 2nd Edition and it's not sure. D&D 4th Edition. Um, Definitely not. Yeah. It is probably, it's definitely more crunchy than TSR D&D, 100%. It's probably like 3rd Edition uh, hmm. in terms of its complexity. Um, like if you were playing 3rd Edition Theater of the Mind, you know, you had a standard action and a move action. And for most of the time, right? Or you could stand still and, you know, attack a bunch. And I like, before Pathfinder 1 and all the archetypes and everything got crazy and ridiculous, like baseline 3.0 year 2000 D&D third edition was a pretty simplistic game. Most of the time yeah. you were just moving and attacking. You might power attack, you know? And it was like, yo, I got a, I got a penalty to my die roll so that I get to add a bonus to my damage roll. You know, simple stuff like that. Um, it feels kind of similar. I would say it's a, maybe a schmidt more complicated than that because of the reactions and the dodge and the parry but um ryan says is it like warhammer fantasy role play i mean assuming you're talking about like second edition or fourth edition warhammer fantasy role play yeah i, I could feel it getting closer into that um yeah i could see i could see there being some sort of, oh tilly is saying that it might be uh warhammer fantasy like yeah i could see that um all right so to wrap up i do want to talk about the, the stronghold stuff really quick because i just think that's really neat um yeah you know, um look, you yeah, please. Sure. So uh, two more things. I definitely yep. want to uh, yep, kind of look at the stronghold stuff. Yep. Uh, the only other thing is I think it might be worth kind of looking at at least a couple of the magic spells okay. to yeah. kind of uh, uh, basically what I want to highlight with that is how magic in this game, it just works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It does what it says it does. It's not <laughs> yes. bullshit, you know. <laughs> You channel the power of 10,000 suns. You get a plus two, you know, damage. To, you know, right, no, right, right. It, it's not that bullshit. It does what it says it does, and it just freaking works. Yes, absolutely. Um, and um, I, I think looking at a couple of the spells would uh, yeah, so yeah, it, be it, good to highlight that. And so just to kind of write real quick, like here's an example of the melee weapons that are available in the game. Um, I think this is a great list. It's not 700. It's, you know, a good 20 items that pretty much represent, I don't know, 99% mm -hmm. of weapons that were actually used <laughs> for all mankind history. Um, but you can see here the damage of some of these weapons is pretty scary, you know? Yeah. Uh, 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 a two-handed sword is three. Uh, even a long sword is two. That's the base damage. So when your character might only have three or four points of strength, uh, if you could hit twice with a long sword and don't have any sort of armor. You're, you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. You're taking yep. a critical hit. Your character is out. So yep. combat goes pretty quick. You do not want to get hit. Um, and even if you do take damage, there's no, eh, we'll just, can we just treat wounds for 40 minutes and we're all full? No, <laughs> like it would take at no, least, you, <laughs> yep. it would take you, you a you long gotta, time. You got to camp for a quarter of a day, yes. maybe longer, and you got to risk, uh, you know, getting, am like, it's a it, whole thing. It's a whole thing. It's it, a whole thing, but that's part of what makes it so it's fun. Part of, well, here's what it is. It is a whole thing. It can lead to a death spiral, and it can feel like you're yeah. drowning and can't get your head above water. But that's why when you do succeed, it's that it much feels sweeter. so much better. Yeah, yes. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Um, so, by the way, the way armor works here is just, um, you can see it has an armor rating. Eight dice, six dice, three dice, two dice, one die. Basically, when you get hit for damage, you roll that many D6s. For every six that you roll, you absorb a point of damage. Um, but for every one that you roll, your armor takes some damage. And its armor rating drops by one. So, for example, if I had plate armor and you hit me, I would roll eight D6. And for every six that I roll, I take one less point of damage. Your your massive two-handed sword just did three damage to me, but I rolled three sixes on my 8d6 from my plate armor. I take no damage, but I did roll one, uh, a single one, which means my plate armor got a little bit damaged by yep. that. And now its armor yep. rating is seven. So the next time I take damage, I'm only going to roll seven dice. Um, yep. And, and this, so this is on why so it forth. becomes very important to have someone that, has these skills to actually maintain gear. So right. And even you know. with someone who can maintain it, you can't stay out in the wilderness <clears throat> forever. Like eventually you have to return to civilization okay. and invest in new items because when items like break completely, they're just broken. 
and there's yeah. you know so like there's a there's a there's fun tension uh between like going back to town and staying being self-reliant very very cool game from that perspective. or you can go back to your stronghold if you have one and yeah. that's another thing that makes strongholds really cool yeah absolutely um all right, I'm not going to talk about conditions or fear or drowning or disease. You know, yeah. they've got they got all uh, that stuff here. But I uh, hungry, thirsty. Yeah, long story right. short, bad shit happens right. if you're hungry or thirsty. It um, feels <laughs> very torchbearer inspired to yeah. me, and I really love it. Again, happy to talk about these things on the Discord. By the way, um, if you want to want to maybe want to someday be here with me going through role playing games like uh, Alia, then join the Patreon. Patreon.com slash nice last call. Um, we have a variety of tiers from the very inexpensive to the absurdly expensive. Um, it all really depends on what kind of premium features you want access to. And quite frankly, how much you want to support this channel, because at the end of the day, we make videos that aren't very popular. And the only reason that we're able to do what we do and the reason why I and Bob and Aaron and, you know, guests like Nick and, and, and dirt uh, on our root show are able to do this and put this much time, energy, effort, and money into this endeavor is because we have a small community of individuals who support us through tips and donations like you all have here tonight or through other monthly Patreon uh, contribution, which really is what keeps the lights on. So if you want to talk about this game, if you want to talk about, 25,000 other games that we may have brought up tonight, um, then, you know, definitely go into, uh, go into, uh, uh, check us out at patreon.com slash nice last call. Uh, yeah, nah is insulting us and saying a deep dive quotes that doesn't explore the advanced combat rules. Yeah. Well, well there's only well, so much, he... there's only so much time in the day, my friend, happy to talk yeah. about them in a different <laughs> session, but, uh, I feel like a lot of people will skip that anyways. And I'd rather talk, uh, about the spells, um, and the, uh, uh, whatchamacallit. So, all right. So you, my friend are an asshole. So I am going to ban you. Thank you. All right. Um, don't be a jerk. Don't be a dick. There's no reason to be that. You can disagree with me without being a jerk. So, um, all right, let's talk about spells. So for starters, uh, like any good old school game, if you uh, basically if you go too powerful on your spells and you try to cast your spell at a higher level than you can possibly contain, you risk a magical mishap, which is like yep. its own special critical table where, oh, you know, mishaps. They're so fun. I love the mishaps, you know, where your mind, you know, explodes and your brain leaks out of your mm -hmm. ears and stuff like that. Um, uh you know, there's it, one where you can literally get ripped out of your current reality and you have to make a new character. It's fantastic. But let me be clear about something here. I don't hate this and I hate this in DCC. DCC has this dungeon crawl classics. Why do I hate it? Because the, uh, you know, <clears throat> this isn't like a guaranteed thing. Mm -hmm. It's a chance. Okay. Yeah. Because unlike your skills, you can never fail at casting a spell. All right. But there's a there's a catch to that, which is if you yep. roll multiple ones, aka the skulls, then you have unleashed powerful magical forces and you roll a D66. Yep. <clears throat> so in a sense, if you're too powerful at your magic, it actually becomes kind of a drawback. Yeah. Because you have a much better chance of creating a magical mishap. If you're just trying to create small minor spells, then you can kind of get away with it a little bit better. Additionally, yeah. I love this rituals. Some complicated spells can't be cast as an action in combat and require more time and preparations. A ritual takes a quarter day to perform. Rituals have other prerequisites that must be performed. So the game basically says, look, if you're willing to trade time for craziness, then that's a fine trade that you yeah. can make. But time has its own, you know, has its own problem as yeah. well. I, I do want to point out a, uh highlight what Sean said there, you can uh, roll at a lower level. Uh, yes. But yeah, that's called safe casting. And that is a mechanic. And um, that is part of where if that is part of where being a half elf is kind of optimal, uh, because their kin talent kind of gives them flexibility to cast spells in a more safe way, without as much risk of backlash. Of course, if you safe cast, you're, you're opting to make your spell less powerful in yeah. exchange for being 
safer. And that's, so I got that, there is a trade off there. And I got that highlighted here on the screen. If you cast a yep. spell to lower rank than your talent rank for the discipline, you may opt to roll one less die for every point difference, which reduces it. Because remember, rolling dice, you, you, you succeed automatically. So if you could somehow roll zero dice, then you're going to be able to cast completely safely. Mm -hmm. So rolling dice is kind of a drawback, but it could also potentially let you cast a spell overcharge, right. which lets you cast it beyond your level. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, it's a risk reward. It's a trade-off yep. and that's what it's makes how, it. How risky are you feeling? It you just know? makes it so fun and so complicated. Yeah. All right. So what do we get? We get general. So as a spell caster, you pick up different spell talents and you can acquire these different spells. Um, and, uh, uh, there's some general spells, kind of like your all purpose, you know, magic users can cast these. Um, but let's take there's a look. The, uh, the grimoires there, those are a big part of safe casting. Ah, uh, yes, right. Your your spell casting is sort of innate, but if you yep. have the you know a tome of magical lore, uh, then casting it is considered one rank lower, so it's easier yep. for you to cast it. Um, but you do have to kind of like take time to pull out your book and cast from it because it's, you know, you're speaking the words of incantation and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, really yeah. cool how they can reward you for that and and yeah. give you these cool items. Um, so is there any spell in particular you want to sort of uh, highlight here? Oh, um, so there's one. I, I can't remember what it's called. It's in the, I believe it's in either death magic or blood magic. But essentially, I think it might even be a ritual. But essentially, you just... Like it just kills everything in a certain area around it. Once once it finishes, it just kills every living thing. Uh, uh, like no caveat, no you know counteract check. It, it's just everything in the area is just dead. Um, ho you know, hope your friends aren't there. Um, I I'm trying to remember what the heck it was called, but there are a lot of interesting well, spells. Another thing to consider is here. Let's just look at the. I think this is fire, or this is blood. What is this? Uh, yeah. So this is the blood yeah. magic, immolate. Yeah. Okay, which is a rank two spell. Uh, and the ingredient requires a torch or an open fire. So you have to have some fire. You literally heat your victim's blood up to the point where they burst into flames. Yep. This spell inflicts damage to their strength score, which again, might only be three or four or five points, equal to the power level of your spell. Remember, spells are always successful. Mm -hmm. this, this bypasses armor. This yep. bypasses parry and dodge. Yeah. There's no chance that you're going to fail this. Um, like I said, spells just work in like this game. If if your <laughs> if the power level yeah. of the spell is three, then boom, you do three damage to them. Yep. And it's no like, ifs, ands, or buts. You just do the thing, and it it just works. Now yep, of course it just works. Now of course to cast the spell requires willpower, requires yep. uh, a casting roll, which could make the person you know blow up and lose their mind but yeah it, it but you could also overpower this uh on a nice roll and you end up doing like five points of un un unmitigatable damage <laughs> it's just insane yep. it's so dangerous and powerful and that's hey, fun yeah. right that's it is fun. fun i agree because it's like if i want to be a caster i want to be a nuclear weapon you know dangerous to be around but boy when i go off stand back Ye yep yep so a lot of really it's, fun, a lot of really fun. Um, it's very fun. Uh, spells in the game and uh, really, really enjoy that. Um, oh, oh, geez. We'll, we'll briefly touch on journeys. Yeah. Um, this we is, should touch on legends too. Uh, if, if you think right. there's, there's so much, there's so much. I know, I know, I know. This, this is why <laughs> we'll probably have to do a second stream eventually. Yeah. But, um, Cause we didn't even get into the GMG, but. Um, right. So real quickly, basically uh, there as, uh, uh, Ailey did a good job earlier talking about there's four quarters to the day, morning, day, evening, night. So this is like a six hour turn and you basically get to decide, um, as an individual or as a group, what you're doing for that quarter day. Um, yep. and as an example, if you want to move to the next hex on the game board, you have to hike. And if you hike, everybody hikes cause you're not leaving anybody behind. But if you want to, well, some of them can, you can keep watch, you can lead the way. On the other hand, if you want to stop to hunt or forage or fish, then that's a choice you might make. Well, why would I ever do that? Because in this game, rations aren't, you don't have 200 rations in your thing and you don't lose 1d3 hit points a week that you go without food. <laughs> um, you get hungry and thirsty and it's really bad for you really quickly. Yep. So what ends up happening is the players are just like, okay, how are we going to budget our day? Oh, we just, yeah. we just left town. We're loaded up with supplies. Great. 
hike, hike. I think you might even be able to hike, hike, hike or something. But, um, but the more you do, the more your resources start to dwindle, then you might want to start to try to provision yourself, rest and camp. You take damage. Now you have to spend a time. Well, that doesn't sound so bad. It is, except every time you do this, there's essentially a random encounter. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that could be problematic for you because this is very much like an old school game. Remember those, ex remember those experience points, things we said at the beginning of the game, uh, aren't like, it's not like you get a bunch of XP every time you fight monsters. Once you've killed one monster in a session, you're not getting any more XP for monsters. So it's just a thing that might kill you and isn't going to give you anything. And that means it's, uh, you, you want to avoid it. So playing smart is rewarded here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they got rules about like hiking and if, how far you can travel, um, you know, if it's open terrain, you can move two hexes, a, you know, per every quarter day. But most of the time, you're probably going to be moving through, you know, wild, untamed land. And you can only move it one per day uh, or one per six hour segment. Um, I will mention one caveat yeah. is that um, something might not give you something for killing it, except when it does. Because if you if you're if you're running around with like, you know, messed up armor and you don't have a quick or easy way to repair it you might want to kill something and take its armor. Oh, true. Uh, you know, true. Like, right. <laughs> because when you kill something, it's not like it, it, it's not a video game or an MMO. It just despawns with all its loot. You can, you can take their stuff like, you know. Um, yeah. Um, and again, everything in this game, it's not like, oh, critical fail. You broke your lock picks. Like if you go and forage <laughs> and you get a mishap, uh, we roll on this table. It's, you know, you got bit by something poisonous. Yep. And you could die um, or at least get really messed up by this mm -hmm. poison. Um, the GM could have a wolf or bear or other wild, ferocious animal attack you. Um, yep. You know, you could uh, damage your armor or your clothing. Um, you could sprain your ankle, giving you a critical hit or critical injury, <laughs> which is equivalent to 25 and 26, which is like you messed up your foot. And like those don't heal well at all. So you know, it, it, you got to, everything in this game has a legitimate yep. price. Now, again, you might be like, well, it sounds like you're going to get ground down into dust. Yeah, kind of. I mean, eventually. Um, but if you play smart and you balance your resources and you're clever and you have good ideas, then maybe, just maybe, you can mitigate those effects and end up yep. being triumphant. And that makes it so much sweeter. It's all about uh, mitigation, planning, and risk assessment at the end of the day. Um mm -hmm. Is really kind of what it comes down to, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> what's so funny about this, by the way, is, uh, hey, Frostjack coming at us with $10 tip. Um, have not been able to tip much lately, but that's all right, <laughs> Frostjack. We love having you here. You know that. No one, no one should ever feel forced or have to tip, but uh, money's tight, but I got to support these deep dives. It's been super fun and informative. Thank you, Ayla and Derek. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. We're happy to do it. This has been uh, lots of fun. So... The reason why this is really funny is the stronghold has this little bit of flavor. Yes, we are still going, Stephen. <laughs> has this little bit of flavor text. It says, Germond licked the naked rock as a dog would. With the dwarf was the dwarf drunk? Uh, there's a stream five L's <laughs> in. A keep mm -hmm. built here would never lack for water. <laughs> um we going back to like I don't even know, probably probably the nineties, you know, we me and Aaron and stuff, we've always loved dwarves. And we'll always have like a dwarf be like like licking a rock. And being like, ah, oh, yeah, the dwar the goblins went this way, and it's like, wh <laughs> what? And it, it like never, it was like an inside joke. So when I read this, I was like, holy shit, somebody else thinking like what we were doing. Um, but stronghold, like we said before, this is a part of the game. It in it, yep. it is a is a, is a prerequisite for certain types of experience points gains. It's a ability for you to regain will point uh, willpower points without having to risk uh, pushing a roll. So building a stronghold can be tremendously effective. And most importantly, it allows your characters to recover from getting ground down out in the wilderness um, without it costing them an arm and a leg. So for example, yeah. you can rest and sleep there without risking any mishaps. You, everyone in your adventuring group gains one willpower point when you arrive home to your stronghold and spend at least one day there. So it's like they, they tip you a free willpower point, but on top of that, you can add to your stronghold. And yeah. there is a whole section here of adding a bakery, a dungeon, a gallows, oh, a library. I, I, I love this stuff. I absolutely love this stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and 
you either like this kind of bookkeeping, you like this kind <laughs> of like building, or you really don't. Right. And like, it, it, I like this kind of stuff. Right. Personally. Like, yeah. Like, if you're like a Minecraft Sim Stardew Valley type of person, this type of stuff you'll you, love. Yeah. You're because, gonna love this. You know, because you're like, oh, I need five. You know, I have three. You know, it's like I'll trade sheep for wood. It becomes really like Settlers of Catan really quick. Yeah. Um, oh, Shadram also with a $10 super chat. Thanks both for this stream. Here's my contribution towards a hex crawl stream. I love the idea of them, but struggle to keep them interesting in play. Yeah, I, I, I know we didn't quite obviously make the uh, hex crawl uh, goal, but I do intend to talk about it uh, probably anyways. Um, and uh, because I think it is really, really interesting. So thank you, Shadram. I appreciate the support and glad to hear that you'd be interested in seeing that. Uh, yes, I am still going. Uh, am I bringing this to Gen Con? I want to try it. Um, I wasn't planning on it, but I mean, we could. Um, Ken says Free League has some good base building mechanics in some of their other games as well. Yeah, I feel like, and I, I've I've looked at a lot of, I've looked at a lot of domain building rule sets over the years from the original basic D and D which quite honestly, I did not like. I felt it was just kind of like, you build a keep, oh. now you have a keep. Well, right? don't, don't say that in front of Ben. I know. But <laughs> He'll come for you. Like, and then I remember Adventure Conqueror King came out and it was just too complex. It was talking about like tithe tax ratios and how many peasants per square foot were on your land and what was your, and I was like, I don't, yeah. this is too much. I will say without, Hesitation. So, so how do you how do you feel like this compares like this building system compares to some of the other ones you've seen? This to me is the best one I've ever seen. It is a <laughs> it is a lovely perfect benefit or balance between being like a little bit of crunch. It, it, it almost feels like, like I said like a little bit like Minecraft or Stardew Valley where you're like oh um, we need this much stone we need this much ore we need this much wood and you build it up and then you get to build and add on something. I mean I would buy a book from Free League that was just like. 50 more pages of this stuff, yeah. you know, to add on. And what I love is that it gives you legitimate bonuses to your character. They can increase your reputation. Yeah. They make it easier for you to repair weapons. They make it easier for you to make weapons. Um, yeah. you, know, you can craft amazingly good gear. Yes. Oh, uh, with the right facilities. And, and we didn't really get into it, but that can make a big yeah. difference to you because mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say this is like breath of the wild or, uh, uh, Tears of the Kingdom, but basically <clears throat> weapon breakage is a thing in this game because your gear will deteriorate when you start rolling ones on your pushes and yep. eventually your swords and shields and all this other stuff, especially your armor and shields, especially your armor and shields are going to get tore up and destroyed. It's just going to happen. So yeah. being a, and it, it's too costly to rebuild this stuff. Like think about it this way. A two handed sword costs 40 gold. Realize that you get an experience point if you recover a great treasure. It says at least one gold. That's what the XP chart says. Like yeah. you, you're not getting thousands of gold here. Like if somebody like <clears throat> it might take you multiple sessions to build up to be able to buy a sword. So if you can yeah. make your own, that's amazing. Yeah, attrition is a cornerstone of this game's mechanics and feel. I think so. Frostjack says, is a base building system portable or is it tied tightly to the Forbidden Land mechanics? I will say this. The effect is, like, you could take this system of how you acquire stone and wood and iron. You could use these costs, the requirements, the cost, the tools, the time, all this stuff. The thing that you would have to change for a different system is... Okay, but what does this give you? Now I'm not trying right. to be what does it do? I'm not trying to be glib here, but like in Pathfinder Second Edition, if you built a forge, it might say you get you get you get a plus one, plus one circumstance yeah. bonus to your craft check. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not I'm not trying to like shit on the game. I mean, but the fact of the matter is that's probably what it would say. You, a hundred percent. That's exactly what it would do. And uh, that's what that that's the language of that game. I mean, if you wanted to be very generous, you could say plus two the problem sure. is not so much with pathfinder 2 i actually don't hate them no uh, no no Th that would be a level eight forge for uh, plus two right right uh sean says tut tut it's an item bonus that's a great question i don't know that it would be mm -hmm. item is usually specifically what you are using uh whereas the circumstance bonus is oftentimes uh, the circumstances in which you are doing it so i would argue that this is a circumstance bonus but we could argue that sean but the problem isn't that you know it would be a plus two circumstance bonus to die roll. And to be honest with you, Pathfinder 2, that's actually a, a pretty reasonable bonus. The problem isn't that. The problem is, but is that effect useful? 
is having a better craft skill actually something that is worthwhile to have in a right. Pathfinder 2 game? The answer, most of the time, hell, is, hell no, no. is hell no. That's the problem. Yep. Okay. It, 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 and I'm specifically targeting Pathfinder 2 here because it's a game that we're also intimately familiar with. It's not necessarily that you can't use these mechanics. You could. The question is, what's my They're motivation? They're just not meaningful. They're just not meaningful. Yeah. Uh, for, hell, this could say you get a plus 10 bonus to craft checks. You crit. It's like, okay, but what difference does that make? I, I, it doesn't allow me to do anything. Yeah. Earn income is still very substandard. Uh, I can't make magical items that are a higher level than me. I can't really save money because any time I would spend crafting an item, I could have just been done earning income, which means I, I'm net zero either way. So that's the real problem um, with this. And like, let's say a Pathfinder 2 game. How do you make this stuff valid? And this is why I say it's not just about a system. It's about an ecosystem. This is a game that gives you these strongholds. Okay, cool. But this is also a game that kind of says, but your players are going to want this. This is going to make their gameplay and their play experience easier. This isn't just some fun, fluffy bullshit thing that they get to add on and they can like, oh, I'll throw a couple 10,000 gold out of whatever. I don't care. I'll just, I'll, I won't buy that plus two rune. Like, no, like this is something that the game is saying your players are going to be struggling. And then when they look at these options, they're going to go, Oh, that's sweet. We should totally get that. Well, that would really help us out. Yeah. Yeah. That would really help us out. So, yeah. uh, very cool system, not too deep, not too complicated, or sorry, not too complicated, not too deep, but just deep enough that you actually feel like there's some bite there, which I really, really appreciate it. And then they also give you the ability to hire people so that you can staff yep. your, 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 your little community there. Um, and, and there are mass combat rules, by the way, because if you start amassing, uh, a bunch of wealth because you know currency has weight in this game you're right. going to need some place to put it all and if you amass a bunch of wealth in your stronghold eventually someone's going to notice to say uh hey maybe we should go and uh you know raid these people's strongholds and uh you know mass combat can come into play here when you've got you know large groups of people coming to try and uh you know take over and raid your stronghold and that, that's kind of another thing we didn't really have time to touch on, but it is also another fun mechanic. Yes. And um, they have a really cool system for basically sort of abstracting the, the uh, you know, a siege or attack on your yeah. keep um, with a sort of a quick, quick and dirty system that honestly, I think does a really nice job of sort of feeling like it sums up well the attacking bonuses and the defender bonuses. And then you I roll. I think it does a good job as well. Yeah. yeah and then you roll against it. Um, and then if the PCs are there to like the lead, the defense, you sort of abstract the background and then you can focus on like one battle that the PCs are playing out. And each turn of the battle, you roll on this random event. And like one of the things could be like, you know, the PCs find themselves face to face with the commander of the attack. Resolve yep. a close combat between them until only one remains standing, preferably in a dramatic location in the stronghold, right? So it becomes this kind of abstracted kind of mass combat system. You're not going to be moving around Warhammer units. Um, it's pretty, pretty, you yeah. know, just abstracted. But again, for me, it's the perfect level of abstraction. And while I have not play tested these rules, um, I do remember feeling like this is exactly the level of crunchiness that I really would want to have seen. Uh, we just got a $25 tip from our Ooh, yeah. friend Sean. Love deep dives. Excited for Root on Tuesday. Boy, so am I, Sean. I think it's going to be great. Um, as a reminder, by the way, uh, I am going to try to do a stream probably Sunday to go over. It might just be a patron stream. So we'll see. I, I'll see how see how I'm feeling. Um, because, of course, we reached both of our tip goals in our Root Session Zero stream. So both the River Company Otters and the Lizard Cult Lizards are going to be making their appearance into the woodland, throwing uh, throwing a little bit more chaos, a uh, wheel of chaos into our existing campaign. Um, and of course, I want to kind of share with the, the the chat and the patrons who made that possible uh, and have them maybe give them an opportunity to to twist the knife a little bit and, and set up some potential problems for our vagabond, a.k.a. the PCs, to deal with. So um, mm -hmm. GM Scott says, I can't wait for the super secret lizard otter stream. Yes, it'll be the Sunday super secret lizard otter stream. Yes. Um, and that is the book. Um, it ends with just some common gear, uh, some, yep. some some trade goods that you might have, you know, tents, chalk, all the stuff that you would normally expect to see in an old school <clears throat> game. But unlike yep. unlike in other games, like 
this gives you kind of most of the time a mechanical benefit. It can be used as yeah. it could be used as fishing. It could be used in, uh, you know, other things. And you're like, oh, so it's one good gear forever. No, because for example, if I have a fishing net, it costs one silver. It gives me a plus two bonus to fishing, which means yep, I get to roll. Which I means I get to roll two, two extra dice. But yep. if I roll a one on one of those d6, the fishing net gets damaged, mm -hmm. and now the fishing net only adds one die. If it gets damaged again, the fishing net is destroyed. So your your gear will deteriorate, especially when you're out in the wilds. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, we get the critical hit chart. We might as well take a look at this. Uh, oh, let, yeah. Yeah, why not? Let's say that you are hit with a slashing weapon. You're going right. to roll a D66. So yep. D6 and then a D6, and you just look at the ones and the tens. I like uh, the severed ear there. Yes. <laughs> you get to the severed minus ear. Minus one to scouting. <laughs> you get a minus one to scouting. Yeah. Um, I believe the healing time is days or quarter days. I can't be exactly remember. Um, so, you know, your character is going to be obviously damaged and will have a you know hard time hearing. Um yeah. and some of these you can see are permanent. Yep. Uh but you can see if you roll low, it's usually not too bad. But if you get higher, uh you know, on a 65 <clears throat> or a 66, your skull is cleft or you are just straight decapitated. Yes, they for yeah. some reason, they felt the need to include two different descriptions of how your character got killed. I guess the question is, did the sword come right down in the middle of your head or did it slice across your neck and take out your head yep. entirely? Um, but I should there also are, know there are there. I do want to say real quick, there are talents that you can take that will mitigate a lot of the risks of rolling on these tables. So, uh, for example, uh, I believe there's a talent that lets you essentially roll twice on this oh, table okay. and take the uh, the less severe result. Uh, so there are ways you can um, make the, yeah, I think lucky. That's the one, Sean. Um, and so there are ways you can, you know, make this a little bit less brutal if you invest the XP. <laughs> uh, Shadrum says, slash mouth. You want to know how I got these scars? Um, <laughs> I should also note here in the fourth column, it says time limit. And that's because punctured lung, severed foot, and bleeding mm -hmm. gut are fatal. Yep. They're just going to take days to kill you. Yep. Whereas ruptured intestines and a severed arm is going to take hours. A slit throat will take just a few rounds. And then cleft skull and decapitation kill you immediately. So actually, about half of the chart will kill you. Yep. It's just some of it, you get a chance to sort of try to heal or restore or get you back to a healer or have a druid perform some sort of magical ritual on you to try to save you before you die. Um, and it's much the same with, you know, getting blunt force trauma or getting stab wound. And then there is for the horror, which is like if your character's wits are broken by a, a undead creature or a terrifying being from beyond the realms that man was meant to know, you get, uh, you know, different traumas and anxieties and different uh, phobias. And if you roll high enough, uh, your character on a 66 dies of a heart attack. So yep. uh, you can literally be scared to death in this game, uh, which is pretty crazy. And then again, here is the character sheet, the strength score. Now we get a little bit better sense of the character sheet. Of course we can see right. here on the left, you're going to see what is your strengths? What is your character's strength, agility, wits, or empathy? And then these little dots are used to mark the damage. Uh, as your character takes damage to that stat, you're going to need some pencils and erasers because you're going to be, this is going to be happening quite a bit. We can mark whether our character is sleepless, thirsty, hungry, or cold, all of which can happen from being uh, without food or being exposed to the elements without water. Those critical injuries aren't just something you can heal with hit points in the night's rest. They get written down here in the box because they're going to be around potentially for a while. Yep. Um, and then we have a spot to list our talents, which are like our feats, which we can be up to rank three, rank one, two, or three. We can have a helmet, shield, and armor, which can help defend us, but will eventually wear down and break. Same thing with our weapons. And uh, I don't. it's a little hard to note, but over here is tracking your experience. Now, it doesn't look like it goes up that high, but that's because, remember, you spend your experience. So... A yeah. character might get a bunch of experience in a session and say, no, I'm saving it. I want to buy some really expensive skill or really expensive talent. Another character might go, I'm spending it as fast as I get it. 
I'm going to pick up this skill at rank one. I'm going to pick up this skill at rank one and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, that that's plenty of marks for XP. I don't think you. Yeah. I mean, I could be wrong, but I, I can't foresee a situation where anyone would hoard more experience than in the than most. That. I haven't played the game, but in the most ridiculous thing in the sheet, they give you 20 spaces for mounts. <laughs> I, I cannot imagine why. Uh, but well, they, well but it's, they... like, it's like having more than one uh, ranged weapon, right? You got to. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. And then lastly, as we mentioned before, your food, water, arrows, and torches. Those are your four main consumables. Those are sort of like how this game represents the abstraction of supplies in the game. Food, water, arrows, and torches. Those are represented by resource dice, which can go all the way up to D12. But every time you roll a, every time you use a torch, use an arrow, you roll that die on a one or a two, the die shrinks from a D12 yep. to a D10, from a D10 to a D8, down to a D6. And then eventually, nothing, nada, you ran out. Um, and so that is the character sheet. We also have a stronghold sheet to write down all those cool functions and smithy and forge and dungeon and gallows that we've included in our stronghold, along with our stockpile. What what goods have we built up? Ore, iron, <laughs> silver, gold, wood, glass. It's like it's like a Settler of Catan slash uh, Minecraft uh, player's wet dream. So really, really fun game. Uh, beautifully, uh, beautifully made, illustrated, done. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, it's definitely on my, if I wanted to do like an old school kind of hex crawl survival game these days, you know, I know I, I I've always loved BX D and D and um, first edition D and D was sort of my favorite, you know, or, sorry, my introduction to role-playing games when I was a young kid for my older cousin, but I think I would go with this game system. I think this is, uh, a really well done game engine and I I'm eager to try it out. I think it'd be fun, but you got to have players that don't mind a death spiral. Yeah. yeah you got to have that. You got to have buy-in with these kinds of games. Um, but I think it's really cool. Now, let me ask you this. I have, so what are, what are your plans with this game system? Are you planning on trying, oh to, run, trying I, to run a campaign or I would, Oh, See that that's the thing. On um, the Discord server? No, I'm just kidding. I listen. I <laughs> I enjoy GMing. Um yes. but oh. this is also the kind of game that I would want to play. Okay. I was gonna say, are you like, are you like being like, I don't want to GM, I I wanna play. I respect, a little bit. I respect like, that. I, I do. Like I'm sure you can relate to that a little bit. Like I know you you mostly GM yourself, right? Correct. Uh but are are there any games that, that you kind of look at and go, you know? I really just want to play this. That's a great question. You know, is there a game that I'm more interested in playing than running? I'd have to think about it. There probably is, but I have to think about it. Um, Ryan says, I've got a community game plan for this. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, I actually expressed interest in that thread and I am still interested, Ryan, if that gets off the ground, could be a lot of fun. I'm waiting um, for my alchemy license for this game to come. It's going to be a while. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, alchemy is a uh, it's a new btt god uh, oh the alchemy yes i know now i know it yeah. uh august 22 ryan says fantastic yeah. uh gypsy lore <laughs> says 53 sessions in it is a solid solid system yeah. well that is fantastic um, yeah oh shadram is absolutely right that is 100 percent right that not as soon as i read it i uh, fabula ultima okay i, sure, I, I, I would rather that. be a player yeah. i think in fabula ultima i could I see think that i would enjoy that. not that i wouldn't enjoy gming it but i think like the, being a player you know in a final fantasy game is would, yeah would be really really cool so that's a great and point. it's the same thing for me in this game i would i think i would still enjoy gming it like don't take that to mean like oh you wouldn't like to gm it well i think i would but yeah, yeah, I, yeah. especially i feel like i would enjoy playing yeah um no that's, so, that's, that's fantastic yeah. um yeah, I, uh, I I'm actually really excited to see that uh, G Lore there says 53 sessions in because um, yeah, it's really you know uh, that's a, a nice vote of confidence. I mean, it's it's tough to get 50 <laughs> 50 plus sessions of any game in, you know, um, and that really shows you that this thing might have a lot of legs that you can play it in. Yeah, and I think that's really cool that this this is a game that you can play long term. Yes. Uh, if you want to. Yeah, Anthony Alessio says I've been running a Facebook game. I'm assuming that's what that means. Um, or maybe he meant to say Forbidden Lands game. But anyways, for the six months, and, uh, and to sum it up, there's plenty of character development and still maintains a level of lethality that my players are still playing with caution. Love it. And I love it. Nice. That's fantastic. Yeah, I want to feel progression. I want yeah. my characters to feel like, yeah, we are better now. You know, what used to just, you know, what used to kill us 
now slows us down. Yep. But I still, I don't want my characters to become gods. I don't want my characters to become walking, you know, tanks. Uh, that just kind of ruins the whole point of the game. So, uh, yeah, uh, that sounds like that will do it. Um, so I know we went an hour over. I th I said we might, but that's all right. Uh, yeah, that, that's fine. And we still did not. We didn't, you know, we didn't get to legends. We didn't get to the GM section. And let me tell you something. Yeah. It's, a, it's a treat. Um, it there's is. A, there's a lot of really fun stuff in this book and in this legends and adventures book. Um, and it's, it's really a fun system and it's got some great procedural elements works really well with any of your favorite <clears throat> random dungeon generators uh tome of adventure design would be right at home in, in this kind of campaign system because let me tell you something uh i gotta i'm gonna show them one monster yeah from the forbidden lands because the way they do monsters is so cool i don't know if i'm giving anything away here but uh let's take a look at a griffin all right yeah yeah all right so there's our griffin yeah it's adorable right it's adorable um we all know griffins oh, 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 there we go um but this is a griffin stat block it has strength 12 it's a big scary monster Remember, mm -hmm. strength is that, how many dice it rolls. <laughs> that, that's that's 12 dice coming yes. at your face. Um, so. <laughs> now, to be fair, it depends, which we'll get to in a second here. Um, sure, and its agility yeah. is five. It has scout of five, a movement rate of three, and an armor rating of yep. three for its feathers. But that doesn't mean it takes three points of damage off. It means it rolls three. Um, right. But it, more importantly, it means it needs 12 damage for this thing to die. But mm -hmm. what's cool is every monster in this book has a D6 roll yeah. that they roll to just kind of determine what they'll do that turn it their kind behavior. of yep. it, it's their behavior it's kind of like they do get cool special moves but you don't pick them you roll them so for example if i roll a one then the griffin is going to do claw strike the griffin uses its very sharp claws to tear an adventurer roll for the attack using nine base dice and weapon damage too so even though i have a strength of 12 i would roll with nine dice to attack yeah. somebody and do two points of damage if I hit with a slashing wound. But if I rolled a two, it would be a claw flurry. Uh, they rear up. And again, you could just have, imagine the fun as a GM. If you're going into the turn, you're like, I don't even know what it's going to do. I'm going to roll. I get to describe this. The, yeah. the griffin rears up and starts raking and tearing in a frenzy. Makes three attacks using six dice for each and weapon damage too. These attacks can be parried, but only one at a time. And so yep. it's like, it's like, and it just means that there's going to be a different fun flavor and feel to everything that this creature does. And it kind of almost gives you as a GM too. It's like, look, I didn't decide what the creature was, you know, like, like the, ta like, yep. I don't, I don't have to meta game tactics. This Griffin, it's like the Griffin, uh, d ducks left. It does a <laughs> somersault and comes up behind the sorcerer and starts, yep. you know, flanking, <laughs> flanking him with the wolf. It's like, what's that? Then it pulls out a grenade and throws it at your spell cast. You know? Yeah, exactly. So, um, <laughs> The, the kind of table makes the monsters seem really, really uh, cool. But here's what I love. Like, here's our Hydra, okay? Obviously, it's a big, scary monster, okay? But look yep. at the second attack. Scream. It mm -hmm. lets out a terrifying scream. All adventurers with a near range suffer a yep. fear attack with five base dice. That means this creature basically spends its turn just, you know, ah, terrifying the shit out of everybody. Yep. And that might do damage <clears throat> to your wits, not your strength. Yeah. Your, your character might run away, fleeing, scared, uh, you know, or potentially be, you know, after the battle when you've won, but your wits have been damaged. That, that right. took that took something out of you. Your character is like, you know, feeling it. Um, I just think that's They're so very, very rattled, right? Rattled, yeah. exactly. And yeah. oh, yeah. oh, maybe we should spend the rest of the day. I'll hunt. The bard will stay here and play music and tell stories and songs and jokes and heal Kinda. this person's wits. Yeah. It's like calm so, your nerves a little bit. Right? Calm your yeah. nerves down. It's yeah. just such a fun back and forth between yeah. gaining resources and losing resources. And uh, the monsters are a big part of that. So um, that, that is that is one thing that we didn't touch much on is that this game does use range bands. Uh, so. Oh, sure. 
Yeah, yeah. So it, it's not like it's you're not operating on a, a five foot grid or anything. Right. Else, it's but, not. Yeah. I don't think it's a mini. I don't think they mentioned minis or anything like that in the whole game. I'm pretty yeah. sure. I think it's supposed to be a theater of the mind um, type game, and you basically have like oh. close, near, far, and then like really far or something. Yeah, it, In, it's intimate, definitely intimate. Yeah, would be the other it's one. it's definitely very much theater of the mind friendly. I think you can definitely run it with maps. Yeah. Uh, as long as you, you know, are paying attention to the range bands if you're still good but yeah yeah i, I think I, it's very theater of the mind friendly yeah I, I i'm a probably, maps person personally i really right. like maps i i like to see kind of i don't know it it helps me out a lot to visualize sure. things and I, and I and we have met people from the patreon and from the channel who some people are like i love theater of the mind uh playing on a grid makes me feel like i'm playing a board game and i never imagine it in my mind and other people say when i play it on a grid it's the only way i can actually imagine it because otherwise i'm struggling to even remember or think or visualize where people are i think it just comes down yeah. to how you how you visually process things and like exactly like yeah. what comes first like the logic part of your brain or the creative part of your brain i think if yeah. i think if you're more logical and thought you know like you're going to thoughtful you're going to like i want to see a grid first to like get that out of the way and then i could start like imagining it and, and diving into it um yeah and i appreciate that this game kind of accommodates both uh both play styles yeah uh Shadram says is there dungeon exploration in the game or is it mostly abstracted um yes uh, there is uh and that's kind of where torches uh come into play is uh so like in northern reaches the way we're doing the um you know the the exploration kind of turns uh it's a little bit like that here where like you know yeah, so much time cool. passes per activity and you have to you know, roll for torches to right. see if you start running out of torches. Uh, so it's kind of a similar idea. So ex a dungeon exploration is a thing. Yeah. Uh, and there are actually very, very nice illustrations of dungeon maps um, for uh, for the campaign setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I didn't have that on my bookshelf, but the Raven's Purge and the Bitter Reaches have some really nice little maps and stuff. It's really, yeah. really cool. Uh, but yeah, Shadram, it, it is not abstracted. I mean, you know, it's, I would say it's more like point crawlish than like yeah you're, you're tracking the ten foot steps that you're taking right but a like point point crawl is a good way to put yeah, it yeah point crawl pretty accurate would, yeah point crawl is how I would describe it so all right everybody it is past ten o'clock it is high yeah. time we get going so <laughs> uh, I want to say a big huge incredible thank you to my guest thank you so much for being here thank you for spending the evening with us. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I know we didn't meet the tip goal, but if you do do a follow up stream, I would be. <laughs> More than happy to uh, come back on and talk about that some more. You know, considering this is our third stream this week, I will be very, very happy with those tip goals uh, and, and where we got with <laughs> that. So that's um, fair. Yeah. Uh, you know, I understand. Listen, you, everyone knows that our audience is the best audience out of any gaming channel, I think, on the Internet, um, not, uh, you know certainly in the RPG space, uh, nobody has the kind of dedication and support that you all have. So, uh, you know, obviously I love doing all these streams multiple times a week, but I understand, uh, you know, that makes it, you can't, can't keep tipping off your time, but we have more content to talk about and more things to talk about. And, uh, we're very happy to bring it to you. So we will definitely, uh, you know, talk to us. Maybe, maybe we'll combine them because we didn't reach each one individual. We'll do like a forbidden lands part two plus hex crawl and talk a little bit about how hex crawling is, is innate, you know, what it is and how does forbidden land sort of promote it and enable it. So yeah. thank you again to all of our incredible supporters, our YouTube members who've joined the adventure, rocking their cool, sexy, colorful badges and rocking their cool emotes. Thank you to everyone who donated and tipped tonight. You all, uh, make these streams very, very fun, very, very engaging. Um, I love having you here and not just for your tips, but also for your commentary and your feedback. Definitely love, you know, having this kind of small intimate crew that we can talk back and forth. And of course, thank you to our patrons for keeping us uh, afloat and keeping this channel, uh, on the right and right. All right, everybody, that is going to do it for me. I will see you later this week. Maybe <laughs> if, uh, if it's not, if it's, if it, but it might just be a Patreon stream. So, uh, Take 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 a take a take a look for it either way. But um yep. uh any any final words, Ayla? GNS score for this game. Ooh, great. God damn, that's good. All right. GNS score for this game. This okay. is a tough one. Yeah, so I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say G. Hmm. I'm gonna say G four N mm, no, let me back that up. I'm gonna say G five N four. S seven. 
Hmm. Which would okay. which would I give mean, it a, which would give it a very high greatness score. Um, yeah. which would put it like a 13 or something or 14. Um, which would, <laughs> you sank my battleship. <laughs> which would imply that this is a really, really great game. But I, I feel like it is delivering on a lot of aspects. I mean, what, what, are yeah, you, what are you debating? Um, All right, let's, let's do it. What do you debate? Do you think the game score is higher than a five? Oh, this is such a struggle for me to quantify because this game is, I, I, like I said earlier, it's barking up so many trees. Um, and... I don't feel like it's overly gamist. I actually think I don't think it's higher than five on the G score. Okay. okay. I think four to five is where I would put it. Um, I actually think it might. I think f you you rated it a five for narrative. I rated it a four for narrative. A four. Yeah. Okay. I was gonna say I would put it at like a three or a four for narrative. Maybe more of a three. Um, for me, I think. Okay. And I um. I think that there's enough. I think there's enough stuff there, uh, you know, uh, for the, uh, what's the word? Uh, it, there's enough dark secret and XP and yeah. pride that I think it does actually tip it like, to four for me. But that's fair. That stuff is there, but it doesn't. I feel like it doesn't dictate enough of the game to really push it above a three for me. So, by the way, for reference, um, game score that we gave. Third edition and fifth. So game score of fifth edition, we gave a five to fifth edition. And we gave Pathfinder second edition a seven. And we gave yep. original D&D, &D, old school, first edition D&D &D, a three. So I definitely think there's more game there than in original D&D. &D. The question is, is, okay. the, is the amount of game in this game equal to less than or greater than fifth edition D&D? &D? Oh, I personally feel it's actually about the same. Yeah, I think it might be. So that there's would make it enough a five. there's enough ambiguity in both systems, I think, that allow for kind of um uh you know, winging it, so to speak, um and being creative with the mechanics. You you might be right. Okay. Um and then for narrative, everything was basically a 1 <laughs> or 0 uh for D&D, &D. Yeah. and I th clearly sure. think that it's more than that. Maybe a 2 or a 3. I mean, I, I said four, but maybe I, I overspoke there. I might, I might revert, re go down to a three. It, it's there and it's important, but it's not like there, like the way you would see in a PBTA game. Or are, are we talking about? Game. The are end, we talking about the, fifth edition? No, I'm just. Saying, I mean, for, for end, just D and D in general. Yeah, D and D and Pathfinder okay. two. All of them were basically ones and zeros. Gotcha. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. sure, sure. There's no yeah, narrative yeah. element. I'm saying this game has narrative elements in the form of the dark secret and the pride. But it's not like fate where there's a meta currency. It's sure. not like powered by the apocalypse where like, oh, I missed. Okay, yeah. I get to make ogres kick in the door. That that doesn't really uh, right. Exist. That, uh, that's kind of why I give it like a three. I, I I mean I can see your no, point. Of I like three. I think four is fine. I think but three. I, think I, three I actually three revised mine to three. So five okay. game, three narrative, and then simulation. Now, uh, we had you gave it a seven, didn't you? I gave it like a. I think like a seven. I mean, I heard seven. Path, uh, the way we had it scored originally, third edition slash Pathfinder one had a simulation score of six. Mm -hmm. Fourth edition D and D had a simulation score of three, right? Which was the same simulation score we gave to fifth edition, and yeah. then Pathfinder we gave a four, two sure. Pathfinder two Pathfinder two we gave a four. I think four is a bit genu uh, generous on the simulation scale for Pathfinder 2. Yes, it was debatable whether it was three or four, but yeah, um, I think um, it's higher than that. And I do agree with GM Scott. The simulation here starts bleeding into my other theory of emulation, right? Where yeah. it, it doesn't feel like it's simulating as much as it is trying to emulate the sure, yeah. feel of survival rather than actually tasking you with surviving, yeah. right? And that's, and that's the distinction. Uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of why I would actually put the S score at like a six because I feel like there's enough that is emulated and abstracted okay. that um that kind of push, pulls it back down to a six. Yeah. Um I, I actually think I, I actually respect that score. So we have a game of five, a narrative of three, which is eight, and then we have a simulation of six, which gives the score a four uh, is that right? Five plus three is eight plus math is hard. Six yeah. is fourteen. Math is tight. Yeah. Which is fourteen. Yeah. Um which gives this technically a better overall composite score than any of our D&D &D games. <laughs> well, I mean. And, 
And I, I, and while I love Dungeons and Dragons, I do think there are elements of it which are just there because they've always been there, or because Gary because Gygax, Sacred Cow, Sacred yeah. Cow, and stuff like that. This is a very purposefully built game. Right. That they thought very carefully about what they wanted to include and what kind of experience they wanted to generate. So it doesn't really surprise me that it, on a, a somewhat objective measure, which is, to be fair, very subjective in its <laughs> application, um, sure, yeah. better than D&D. So yeah. there we go. All right. That was a fun little exercise. Um, We're yeah. going to wrap up. Thanks again to all of you. Thanks again to our co-host. And we'll see you next time on Night's. Of last call. Right, bye, bye, everybody. everybody.